so um good evening to all of you uh before going to start um, our um, seventh international level online faculty development program on gender sensitivity let me tell you all that the outbreak of the corona virus has caused problems in the functioning of all countries of the world health medicine education business economy etc are all affected that the governments of all countries institutions they are all trying their best and they are all trying um, the all the experts and the academicians are working working together on the construction of a new path for the future in accordance with the present scenario the disruption in continuity of education has presented among teachers and prospective torch bearers a very natural concern for the future certainly it this is the right time to again remember the four pillars of education that is learning to know ganjo learning to do karmajo learning to live together sahajog and learning to be atma so in this context i believe that educational authorities can help young people academicians students and activists to engage in the online education in the online environment in a safe sensitive critical ethical and responsible way while celebrating and promoting the educational initiatives that are led by us taking this as our point of departure the women cell and the department of english borobaje bikram to memorial college it's located in purulia west bengal india welcome you all to this a week long international level faculty development program and this faculty development program now let me tell you that borobaje bikram to memorial college it's affiliated to sidhu kanu birsha university now let me tell you something about my college it, it is one of the premier institutions in the district of purulia west bengal it is scattered consistently to provide excellent educational opportunities that are responsive to the community's needs and endeavor to help students to meet their economical social and environmental challenges to become active participants in shaping the future the department of english borobaje bikram to memorial college has strived endlessly for the students and teachers holistic growth provide with newer horizons of thinking encourage research acumen develop reflective and analytical skills and inspire humanistic approach to issues with this in mind the department has consistently conducted in house lectures natural national and international seminars webinars conferences focused on the curriculum in the covid-19 lockdown period e conferences have been conducted with speakers from the national and international stage now let me tell you all about the concept note of this day it's a why this kind of uh, initiatives we have taken because literature has been used to challenge expose and undermine cultural presumptions about gender the feminist epistemology has attempted to probe the nature of women's experiences as individuals and social beings this probing has resulted in a shift in perspective developments in feminist discourse have been moved beyond gender inequality to the point where gender itself has become an unstable category Judith Butler's seminal book Gender Travel for the Develop This Fluidity of Gender by refusing the social characteristics assigned to a particular biological sex binary gender categories have been reconstructed to reveal many gender opposites but this has led to us to ask if gender is constructed can it be constructed differently is our culture and biology destiny how do historical and cultural specificity is determining gender hegemonic masculinities have been challenged particularly because identity is not fixed fluid and doesn't determine who we are several questions have been raised about violence against women questions of choice and care women and migration body positivity workplace feminism home as the site of social relations structured by 
power and inequality gender divisions of space and workspace workplace sexual harassment and its connotations digitally driven movements trans inclusivity etc are all there there has been a conscious attempt to reclaim the different experiences and i believe this program will attempt to capture the theoretical and practical aspects of the study to foster awareness and receptivity towards the immediate and larger environment and diversified perspective we have speakers especially from india bangladesh and pakistan who will debate the subject position and disseminate the cultural and social appropriation the objective of this seven day online fdp on gender sensitization will be to locate the paradigmatic and polymorphous nature of discourse on gender studies that have moved beyond the corridors of academia and traversed into the heterogeneous discourse of everyday life now before moving to the sessions of this opening day i am requesting all the participants listening on youtube live to remember the three points and at the same time uh, i am i am extremely overwhelmed to witness such a huge response on your side now first of all if you want to ask any question to any of the speakers during the fdp please send those to the whatsapp number that i will mention in the chat box and you can also use the chat box section on youtube to write in your questions and observations but as i am the only host and I, and i i have to host all the speakers and i have to keep myself engaged with all other technical activities so it may be impossible for me um, to pick your questions from the chat box so i am requesting you to send me to the whatsapp number that i will mention and the assignments based on the topics of the presentation will be given to the participants daily and they must have to submit the assignments within 12 hours and e certificates will only be awarded to those participants who will submit assignments every day and complete all necessary formalities now today the inaugural session will be delivered uh, or the inaugural address will be delivered by professor ranu umyal who is the professor and hot of department of english and modern indian languages university of lucknow india and it will be followed by the introductory speech by professor aparajita hajra who is the professor and hot department of english sidhu kanu birsha university and after that we are going to be enriched by the speakers like professor smita agarwal who is the uh, professor of uh, english at the university of allahabad india dr k a geeta who is the associate professor of uh, english literature language and cultural studies bits goa campus and professor asha sen who is the professor of post colonial uh, literature and theory university of wisconsin uclear us now before uh, before uh, giving the stage to professor ranu unil ma'am let me tell you um, about professor ranu unil and who is that apart from being awarded with the phd degree from hall university uk for which she got the commonwealth scholarship and mphil from jnu new delhi she was nominated for commonwealth post doctoral fellowship by ugc in 1997 and ugc visiting associate award in 1994 95 now if i start telling something about her publication it will take no longer than 20 minutes to do that and professor unial will be there till 5:30 so you can imagine the highly inspirational and illustrious academic career she has and for for those who still don't meet poet ranu unial yes uh, she is a poet too and her works uh, have been translated into several languages so let me tell you that with her first book of poems across the divide popularly well responded by the readers the december poems is the second anthological tour de force of professor unial one of this one of the strongest women poetic voice of contemporary writing in indian english with 58 poems showcases in that book she evokes emotions and feelings in readers as the po- as her poems deal with everything uh, oft bickering in and around human life Her poetry collection, that day we went strawberry picking in Kerala, carries a special connotation, and it is worth mentioning for this FDP also, uh, which is going to explicate the nuance of gender sensitization. So.
So her this poetry collection, particularly the day we went strawberry picking in Scarborough, this poetry collection essentially poetizes a modern women's journey from innocence to experience, the tumultuous journey from joyful aspirations of love and companionship to betrayal, anguish, tears, silence, in clouds of flavors, rhythm, colors, and caresses, and the personal experience of the loss of sweetness of her tongue through a layered. a uh, tale of invasion domination uh, destruction that transforms the land culture and language and her tale implies how seamless judgment to use and abuse in the wicked drops of patriarchy that rob women of their innocence turning the molasses into art and fiction so it seems that her poetry now even captivates me in such a way that i took almost 10 minutes to introduce professor uniel with you all now i'm requesting professor uniel to deliver our inaugural speech for this seven day international level online faculty development program on gender sensitization i would like to thank the women's cell and the department of english at bada bazar bikram tudu memorial college purulia dr chandrakant panda dr shri rupa and dr gautam kormakar for inviting me to give the inaugural address Gautam, you have given an extensive introduction. Uh, thank you. I am a woman, and I too have my dreams. Look at me and tell me what have I done to deserve your apathy? Do I have to scream to be noticed? Do I have to weep to be heard? Do I have to remain silent to be alive? Have I done wrong by lifting the veil and holding the pen, by stepping out in the sun and dancing in the rain, by sharing my joys? and splitting the pain as students of literature we have read and relished books books have inspired generations with ideas and philosophies have nurtured us with values and emotions gender sensitization i just want to know am i audible yes you am are. i audible yes 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 so when we talk of gender sensitization it is about human lives relationships borders practices beliefs images stereotypes that have shaped guided transformed in meaningful and ambiguous ways i am reminded of a similar talk by virginia wolf to a women's college in cambridge that was wolf in 1928 and the series of lectures was published as a room of one soul this is 2020 and parallels end here in 1918 The world was battling with Spanish flu, and in 2020, we are all in the grip of COVID-19. Have the issues and concerns changed in the last hundred years, or are we battling with the same old issues related to women's empowerment? Has the woman's writing been able to make a visible change in women's lives by providing them a right to live with dignity, privileges that come with light and learning? given them the space to live and walk fearlessly we have a great deal to learn from our predecessors shakespeare's england saw a dearth of women writers and we still remember the shadow of judith shakespeare hovering over us an imaginary sister who had she existed would have been a victim suicide and had she dared to act or behave like her brother william for centuries i would like to say that women have actually been denied their place it is for centuries we were silent and once we began to speak nothing was hidden there's actually the electricity has just gone off so i'm just continuing with the reserve with the battery for centuries we have remained silent but once we began to speak our stories which were hidden came out in a gush and what were these stories about they were stories of suffering withdrawal pain and continuous tales of violence wife beating and what not you know uh, just a sec i think i'll have to um, just uh, make things clear because i cannot see the screen the lights have gone off hold on just a sec please now i 
I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, there is a slight disruption here. Okay. Shakespeare's England saw a dearth of women writers. And then in the present century, we see that women have started speaking. But once we began to speak, nothing was hidden. There is enough evidence to suggest that gender sensitization is still the need of the hour and power and politics are central to its domain. Chris Whedon has rightly said that gender sensitization is directed at changing existing power relations. These power stru relations structure all areas of life and our family, education and welfare, the worlds of work and politics, culture and leisure. They determine who does what and for whom, what we are and what we might become. Women's movement has emphasized the need for equal opportunity, the right to live a life with dignity, the right to choose and function without an agency that is predominantly male. Feminist scholarship has also been looking at, when we talk of gender sensitization, we find that scholarship has been looking at the systematic neglect of women's experience in the literary canon. And a common argument is that women's sexuality defines them. They are there as either virgins or whores, seductresses who lead to the downfall of the male protagonist or are innocent of all matters sexual and material and must therefore be protected from the wickedness of the world by men. The female trinity therefore constitutes the Devi, the Mata and the Kulta, the angel, the mother and the whore. When we talk of gender sensitization, it is important for us to refer to some of the images of women by men. Having read Dunn and Pope, and the responses to women as in the apparition when Dunn says, when by thy scorn, O murderess, I am dead, and that thou that thinkest thee free, then shall my ghost come to thy bed. What I will say, I will not tell thee now. But you will painfully repent for rejecting me. Or in marvels to his boy mistress, it is difficult for the speaking voice to face rejection at the hands of a man or a woman. So he admonishes her. And he, what does he say? Worms shall try that long preserved virginity and your quaint honor turn to dust the graves of fine and perfect place. But none, I think, do their embrace. Lines which we really enjoy and laugh at but a gender-conscious critic would find it difficult to swallow the patriarchal pun. Early 18th century, we have the most representative text, The Rape of the Lock, where Belinda is a mere sign without a value, an object to be possessed. The wise man's passion and the vain man's toast, only to become a degraded toast after the loss of her lock of hair. Whoever scorns a man, must die a maid, and all the fanfare associated with her art and artifice must, and the time that she spends at her toilet must end up with, forever cursed be this detested day, what moved my mind with youthful lords to roam. Oh, had I stayed and said my prayers at home. Mind you, this is what a young girl in her 20s is asked to do even today in many conservative families. Unfortunate, but true. Because the state does nothing to give us security and punish perversity. Ellen Polak rightly argues that woman's entire value is tied up with her identity as a piece of property that is transferable among men. Belinda is an empty vessel on display. Surrounded with the Bible and Beledu, the two contradictory forces in her life, I want to ask you, how many of us can afford to indulge ourselves in this fashion? 
only women and pope conscious of the cosmetic powers that Be belinda is reduced to nothing by the cosmic powers and the cries of anguish are drowned in the cosmic music of her female adversaries palestris and clarissa according to germain gear there have been women who have enjoyed dazzling literary prestige during their own lifetimes only to vanish without a trace from the records of posterity and i want to ask why is it that women who were successful in their own lifetime never became a part of the canon dorothy wordsworth played second fiddle to william and allowed him to borrow extensively from her journals for his poetry men steal the fruits of women's creative labor says matilda joslin gage d h lawrence fitzgerald thomas hardy are a few names that come to my mind as men who borrowed extensively from their women but never acknowledged them keeping women out of the literary and cultural tradition was a political move which was challenged by thinkers and critics like wolf simon de bova adrian rich judith butler elaine sisu and several others when virginia wolf said that women act as looking glasses she made a very poignant statement what is a woman asked simon de bova in her opening introduction to the second sex and the answer was woman is a womb because her identity is determined by her role as an agency that reproduces the binary that exists between reproduction and production nature and culture man and woman was also suggested by elaine sutu when she spoke of man and woman being represented by light and dark wisdom and ignorance woman was seen as the man's other she was also viewed as the dark continent not just by simon de bova but she took the idea from even fr from sigmund freud while it is important for us not to look at gender as a monolithic whole dealing with the question of self and identity for gender is not a homogenized entity but specifically determined by the specifics of the body every woman has known the torment of getting up to speak said lain sutu speech has been governed by the phallus and it is this control over speech this aggressive eruption of the masculine authority that has finally been chased and challenged by the creative artist the poet and kamla das mahadevi varma sujata bhat meena alexander are few such examples if poets like sappho from the island of lisbos around 600 bc and suniti nam joshi in the 21st century could subvert the heteronormative conventions by expressing same sex desire there have been voices of nagarjun and nirala who have shown empathy towards the poor and the impoverished two distinct examples of the continuous shift between tradition and modernity and gender sensitization are visible in two novels choker bali a 1902 novel by tagore and samskara by anant murthy which was written in 1965 in samskara we see that pranesh acharya is an acharya who is looking after an invalid wife hoping to attain salvation through service in the course of the novel he falls from grace moves out of the agrahara and goes on a journey which problematizes his inner quest for identity he is in a state of existential anguish after a night long sexual communion with chandri a woman from the low caste now the novel traces his angst the male perspective and how he sheds all the trappings of the orthodox tradition but this modern tale of a man has in the words of ak ramanujan an inconclusive anti climactic use of tradition very much like pranesh acharya vinodini too is looking after her old and ailing husband she too goes through sev several experiences after his death her relationship with asha and mahend and bihari form the subject of her story it is a new age story but at the end of her story this dynamic young woman does not accept a conventional life her moving towards kashi has a moral ambiguity she has to move so that those who are together 
may sustain, may survive. Widow remarriage was still a taboo in the early 20th century Bengal. However, much he wished, Tagore could not break the stereotype by letting her marry and settle down as a traditional Hindu wife. Puja, Param Bhakti and Param Gati, salvation through selfless service is the defining quotient in a widow's life and a step away from it is seen as a transgression. Hence, the journey to Kashi. We can see that the patriarchal gender order discourages change and continues to celebrate conformity in relation to women. One is not born but becomes a woman, said Simon de Beauvoir. I would like to add one is born and becomes a man. And how casually we dismiss men with statements like, Ladko se galti ho jati hai. Ek galti karke ladki sari zindagi uski aag mein jalti hai. Uska khamiyaza bhogatti hai. But men remain unfazed. I am reminded of a short story by Rashid Jaha. Wo jal gai. She got burnt. Where the death of a young woman, Vimla, is dismissed as an accident without a post-mortem. This is not just one story. But a feisty woman like Rashid Jaha, a gynecologist and a communist who was writing in the 1920s and 30s about gender discrimination, also wrote how religion, class and caste failed to resolve the contradictions that led to inequality between men and women. Violence against women continues unabated. Rajeshwari Sundar Rajan has rightly pointed out that newspapers regular coverage has more of news value rather than concern for the rights of women. Even high profile deaths are eventually forgotten and the voices remain stifled with the images permanently tucked in our minds of women who died inside the bathtub or the swimming pool or in their bedrooms. They were liberated women who ate and drank freely, led a life of leisure, consumed alcohol, smoked and danced. See, it serves them right, fallen women, and they deserve this fate. Let us also not forget women who are raped and then hanged to a tree or drowned in the local river. On one hand, we see the new Indian woman who is urban, educated, middle class career woman. She's ambitious, persevering, determined, loves to travel, lives on her own. This new woman is the one with the power of purchasing, an ideal consumer who, ha who has arrived with a credit card. Her ability to purchase has given her a freedom which was denied to her predecessors. She's also the one who is visible in media, TV ads and social campaigns. But there is a catch. She's modern. She's also a threat. She must be subdued, suppressed, reminded of her secondary status and the social structure sees her as the one who must preserve tradition, sabhyata, sanskriti and srishti. She is the custodian of all. It must be preserved by the female subject. Unfortunately, the rural peasant woman, the tribal woman, the Dalit woman and the disabled remain invisible, incognito. She is nowhere because she is nothing. Sexism and masculinism is intricately bound up with what is socially appropriate for both men and women. If masculinism is the embracing of phallic morality for both, it is Sheila Ruth who argues that as a man must flee from the Venus principle within himself, hold that configuration in contempt, he must also hold woman in contempt for in patriarchy she is the incarnation of venus and nothing else i would like to add that it is not just woman but also man who is in the process of being and becoming gender is not a fixed category but is fluid full of complexities unstable erratic ever-changing now is the time for us to reassert and consciously recreate our identities and question the binaries. Those who conform to established traits of masculinity and femininity are today in a state of jeopardy. As we map this trajectory, we realize our notions of gender ignore the fact that 
cultural context might differ. Contamination, impurity, social distancing are some of the terms women and disabled and those on the lowest rung of the caste system have always been associated with. Gender, sexual, class, and caste hierarchies have played a distinct role in reducing women as inferior subjects. It is interesting how with the onset of COVID-19, which is connected with contagion, the word contamination has acquired a new normal status irrespective of gender and other hierarchies. The only fear that has drawn us close or might draw us apart is the fear of survival. Survival is an important issue. It is our basic need. And maybe there is an underlying message that we have to read and reflect on that in order to survive, we must all be together, if not in bodies, at least our hearts and mind must now think of a world that connects, respects, reveres diversity, differences, and learns to promote principles of equality and justice for all. I would like to uh, co conclude with a poem, which is in the company of women. The title of the poem is In the Company of Women. I'm often asked, why is it that I prefer being in the company of women? Not all, but certain women I prefer. Let this be clear. For years, they have slogged to keep themselves warm and men happy. Warts or boils, corns and aches, they refuse to shudder. Sights and smells travel far. And with them, I have seen my own sadness tumble and dissolve into a mist of hope. I become perky and young. Forget my swollen thighs and cauterized uterus. A healthy camaraderie between us flits and wands me inside out, tucking in the fragrance of jasmine and basil. We become whole and lovely all at once. Between us, slabs of silence rip open prolonged secrets that were ashamed to be rinsed. We lean on each other's arms and often lend a tear or two. We make a pillow of shredded promises and laugh in sleep. No, we do not speak the same dialect, but we do share the calligraphy of the heart. However quiet, however crumbled, we learn to draw from dried up wells and hence we multiply our joys. By accepting difference and diversity, by accepting each one as one, then only can we talk in terms of bridging the gap between genders as such. And then only can we talk of gender sensitization. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, and at the same time, so thank you, ma'am, for taking your time to give this FTP a grand opening. And I felt that your remarks were truly timely and give birth to certain questions, which will be answered by others in this program. And and we truly appreciate poets and activists like you who are willing to give their time and talents to make people aware of their role. So, ma'am, many thanks for addressing our listeners students, peers, and colleagues on gender sensitization. Hope to meet you soon. Stay safe and sound. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, let me welcome Professor Oparajita Hajra, who will deliver the introductory talk. And before that, I can't resist myself from introducing our beloved D. Yes, I address her as Aparajita D with you all. Professor Dr. Aparajita Hajra 
He is a professor and head of the Department of English, Sidhu Kanubirshi University, West Bengal. She is the former Dean of Arts there, a gold medalist and a national scholar. She has 23 years of teaching behind her. Professor Aparajita Hajra has contributed a large number of articles on literary topics in various national and international journals and newspapers too. She has also presented numerous papers in various national and international seminars in India and abroad in countries like France, New Zealand, Macau, Malaysia, Canada, New Zealand, Georgia, and Scotland. She has been invited as guest faculty in educational programs on television. She has been also invited to deliver lectures on literature in various universities and academic staff colleges in India. She is the Indian collaborator of the World Shakespeare a Project, a global venture initiated by Emory University, Atlanta. She also takes classes regularly with the students of Emory University through video conferencing. She has four books to her credit, namely The Terrible Beauty, A Hideous Progeny, Medicine Frankenstein, The Brontes, A Senior uh, Sonority of Passion, and The Art of Articulation from Macmillan Publishing. Now, I'm um, welcoming the to deliver her talk. Thank you very much, Gautam. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, finish up the technical glitches. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Thank you very much. Now, I should really thank you for those very kind words. I don't know how much I deserve all that praise, but uh, you actually are uh, like a younger brother to me. So when you invited me over, there was no question of saying no as an answer of the, of the entire program, sure enough. But today I'm going to talk about a very particular thing that working women like us you know, are well acquainted with. So I am going to uh, give you a PowerPoint presentation on the glass ceiling and the sticky floor and uh, we are going to see how gender sensitization is negotiated through those two binaries now if i may share my screen gotham can i do that yes yes you can so let me just share my screen uh, you have to open the uh, file in the yes yes it's already open so it should come in the application window. You have to go to shared screen and then again share screen. I went to share screen and then I'm then again to open share the screen. application window. And yes, and then you have to go to application window. Yes. Hmm. Application window should be showing the PowerPoint, shouldn't it? Yes. It must have to be there. Yeah. You have to open the PowerPoint yes, and in the background, but it is not showing here till now. But the PowerPoint is open in the background. Okay. Yes, it is open in the background. Just give me a moment. Yes, now it's there. Okay. Is... I think the thing is slow. There. Is it there on your screen right now? No, no, it's not there. Till now. But here it says stop sharing, yes, which means yes, it is already yes. sharing. Got it? Yes, it is. Is it there, there on the screen now? Uh, yes, 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 yes. So yes, it I, is. I'm talking about the screen. Great. So we are good to go? Yes. You can go. So should I start? Go? Yes, 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 yes. All right. So a very good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much. A very good afternoon to everybody. Um, like Gautam um, was very elaborate in his um, you know, introduction to me. I am Aparajita. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to talk about the glass ceiling or sticky flow today, negotiating gender sensitivity. Now, before going on into any discussion about why this happens or what is actually the prob what are the problems that uh, women face when they are 
talking about the glass ceiling or where they, when they are talking about the sticky floor, we should just do the normal ritual of trying to define these two rather tricky terms. So let's see what these terms actually mean. Now, in order to define glass ceiling, in a number of ways. So we will just take a look and draw our own conclusions and uh, we'll uh, bring out a definition. So John Wiley in the Blackwell Encyclopedia of Gender and Sexuality Studies mentions that the first person said to use the term glass ceiling was Marilyn Loden during a 1978 speech. So the fact that the term was being in, in circulation in 1978 means that the term is ages older which means the problem is ages older and it's now only becoming to getting termed into uh, vocabulary again according to ben zimmer in the phrase the glass ceiling stretches back decades there's a nine this is the entire name of the article he wrote and published in the wall street journal the term glass ceiling was coined in the spring of 1978 by Ma marianne scriber and catherine lawrence so 1978 seems to be the crux point. The term was later used in March 1984 by Gay Bryant, the very famous person, the former editor of Working Woman. Bryant used the term in a chapter of the book, The Working Woman Report, Succeeding in Business in the 1980s too. Basia Helwig also used the term in an article written by her. In a widely cited article in the Wall Street, Street Journal in March 1986. The term was used in the article's title, The Glass Ceiling, Why Women Can't Seem to Break the Invisible Barrier That Blocks Them from the Top Jobs, written by Carol Heimowitz and Timothy Skelhart. In an Adwick article written by Bryant a little earlier, now Gay Bryant was quoted as saying, women have reached a certain point, I call it the glass ceiling. They are in the top of the middle management that is they have, have the low manage, lower management lower point management the middle management i call it the glass ceiling they're in the top of the middle management and they're stopping and getting stuck there isn't enough room for all those women at the top some are going into business for themselves and others are just going out and raising families which means that they are no longer working women's women Heimowitz and Skelhard, the two uh, authors that I named a little earlier, said that the glass ceiling was not something that could be found in any corporate manual or even discussed at a business meeting. Nobody talks about it. It was originally introduced as an invisible, covert, and unspoken phenomenon that existed to keep executive level leadership, I love this phrase, positions in the hands of the Caucasian males. So nobody talks about it. Nobody really discusses it. You know, uh, I'll come to Foucault a little later, but if you remember that Foucault in his Archaeology of Knowledge once said that the first point being it should not be uh, considered to be taboo, then only does a discourse come up. The second point is that it should uh, the person who's broaching the topic should not be considered insane. Insanity or the words according to Foucault, institutional ratification, which means that if only if you have institutional ratification to a certain subject, then only is, is it fit, is it de deemed fit to be considered as a discourse. But the glass ceiling is something, uh, you know, it's only come kind of like a woman's issue. Nobody really talks about it. It's always brushed under the carpet and it's very hush hush. And that is because, uh, ac according to what Hamowitz and Skelhart say, they mean to say that it's almost a kind of like a, a part of a bigger conspiracy, you know, to keep the management, to keep the top hierarchical order in the hands of in 1991, as a part of the Civil Rights Act of 1991, the U.S. Congress created a glass ceiling commission. You know, anything U.S. always ends up in a commission. So this ended up in a glass ceiling commission. This 21-member presidential commission was chaired by the Secretary of Labor at the time, Robert Reich. Their report in the November 1995 said, a glass ceiling is a metaphor used to represent an invisible barrier that keeps a given demographic 
demographic typically applied to minorities, which mean uh, not only women, but also the other ethnic minorities, from rising beyond a certain level in the hierarchy. The report also mentioned the glass ceiling as those artificial barriers based on attitudinal or organizational bias that prevent qualified individuals, and when I talk about individuals, please read women, from advancing upward in their organization into management level positions. A glass ceiling then, drawing our own conclusions, a glass ceiling then represents a barrier that prohibits women. And here I, such, I should say that it's an invisible barrier. What it is exactly that is keeping them back, many women will seldom be able to put it out in words what exactly it is because a glass ceiling can mean attitudes a glass ceiling can mean uh, an interplay of emotions a glass ceiling can mean mental harassment a lot of things can come into the purview of the uh, umbrella term called glass ceiling so a lot goes on beneath that ceiling and so it's an invisible barrier it's not a very diff it's very difficult to pinpoint a barrier that prohibits women from advancing towards the top of the hierarchical organization in spite of the requisite qualification. The glass ceiling metaphorizes the umpteen invisible barriers through which women can see the elite positions above them, above in the organizational ceiling, but just cannot reach them. You can see them above you, but somehow or the other, something pulls you back and you cannot really break through the glass ceiling and reach what you want, your objectives. These barriers apply to ethnic minorities as much as to women. But today, since we are talking about gender sensitization, and uh, I'll talk about women in general a little bit more. David Cotter defined four distinctive characteristics. Now, how do you, if people don't talk about the glass ceiling, if the glass ceiling is something that is an invisible barrier, then how do you understand that there is a glass ceiling in this organization, be it corporate, be it academic, be it uh, uh, administrative, any kind of organization that we are talking about, how do we understand that there is a glass ceiling above us? Now, David Potter distinguished four different kinds of characteristic features that must be met in order to conclude that a glass ceiling exists. A glass ceiling inequality represents, number one, a gender or racial difference that is not explained by any other job relevant characteristics of the employee. So there is some kind of a differentiation that you cannot explain by a job relevant reason. That is, you cannot say that this person, the so and so person is being dis discriminated against because she or he has not done her or his job properly. So you cannot just at higher levels of an organization than at lower levels. Clear enough? A gender or racial inequality in the chances of advancement in, into higher levels. That is when you're trying to go at nearly the proportions of each gender or race currently at, at the higher levels. So we are not only talking about how many women are there uh, in ratio with how many men there are in the higher levels. We are talking about the chances of going into a gender or racial inequality that increases over the course of a career. You know, when you're in the lower parts of your career, when in the lower graphs of your career, then it's not that much. But the more you rise up, the, you know, the barriers seem to loom up even more than ever. Duars Lahti and Kelly rightly observed that the way we think about gender is the key to the way we think about gender reform. Now, when you talk about gender reform, you first need to think about gender. And when you think about gender, you have to climb above the uh, sexual binary, which is the biological sexual binary of who's a man and who's a woman. But most of the time, people in society, in the workplace, they just muddle up between sex and uh, gender. They don't understand that gender is a social con construct and sex is just a biological matter that we are born with. In the approach pioneered by Acker and Burton, organizations them, themselves, not the, just the people them, within them, you know, an organization, like I said, be it academic, be it administrative, corporate, anything, an organization is made up of people. 
So you cannot just say that uh, gender sensitization needs to be all about the people, but an organization also has an aura of its own. And that aura itself can give you gender binaries. I'll, I'll tell you how, by and by, are seen as the bearers of gender. Specifically, organizations create and reproduce gender divisions of labor, cultural definitions of masculinity and femininity, and ways of articulating men's and women's interests. Organizational arrangements often sustain gendered occupational cultures from the masculinity of the printing worker. So the printing press worker becomes a man and the, man, the femininity of the secretary of the office lady. You know, the office lady is always there as a, as a secretary who's there. So somehow people seem to feel that a secretary has to be a lady. As a Girardi and Poggio document, women's entry into masculine domain, domains triggers complex adjustments in which symbolic gender dichotomy may be preserved even when other changes are considered. This is unfortunate because even when you have this uh, positive yen to change the glass ceiling, to change the, the gender discriminations, some residual factors might even be there, which even you are not aware of. But then women who are facing the glass ceiling encounter it and understand it. According to the glass ceiling approach, the gender is understood as two fixed categories of persons, men and women, defined by biological sex. But gender is a social construct. Even as a social construct, gender is a dynamic system, not a fixed dichotomy. Patterns of interaction and relationship keep changing. What I mean to say is that I will talk about Yuri Bronfenbrenner and his ecological systems theory a little later where you will come across a term called the called the chrono system which means that the gender binaries keep shifting from age to age like if i want to give you an example what my mother construed to be femininity what what my mother construed to be uh, the freedom of the gender might not be my terminology of freedom of genders you know, so I, I have different ideas. I have different ways of interaction. I have different ways of keeping relationships with uh, family members, relatives, even people at my workplace. It is increasingly recognized that gender patterns affect relations among the men and women in, and obviously in, a, an, in an organization. Now, the overall pattern of gender relations within an organization is, is known as the, as the gender regime of that place. There may be a local gender regime or which may or may not reproduce a wider gender order. What I mean to say is that, like I work in Shidukanu Birshai University. Now, which is situated in Purulia, which is situated in Bengal, which is situated in India. So there might be an Indian gender order. Inside that, there might be a Bengali gender order. And inside there, there might be a Purulian gender order. And there will also be a local gender regime that is, you know, very uh, particular or signature to Shidukanu Bishai University. So that might or might not tally with the other gender factors. Now, four dimensions where the gender regime is normally evident are gender division of labor, like the woman becomes the receptionist and the accounts officer is mostly a man. I think you'll agree with me. Gender relations of power in which control, authority, and force are exercised along gender lines, including organizational hierarchy, legal power, collective, and individual violence. Emotion and human relations, the way in which affinities and antagonisms among employees are organized along gender lines, including feelings of solidarity, prejudice, disdain, and sexual attraction and repulsion. What I mean to say is that, uh, you might be very friendly with another man. If you are a man, then you might be very friendly with another man because he's a man. And you might be antagonistic with, uh, about a woman just because she is unfortunate enough to be a woman. Again, you might be drawn to that lady just because she's a woman, which is not right at all. Gender cul culture and symbolism. The way in which gender identities are defined in culture, the language and symbols of gender difference, and the prevailing beliefs and attitudes about gender. That really influences the gender regime of a work culture a lot. You know, or the gender culture of the society we come from.
forms of gender division of labor like men's work and women's work some examples secretarial functions combining keyboard work reception telephone answering normally goes to women drivers building caretakers are normally men work related to the motor industry normally goes to men work related to the beauty industry normally goes to women dealing with human resources and community affairs mainly women professional officers dealing with economic issues which takes us back to the you know the finance officer uh, trope mainly men dealing with a problem dealing with computer services normally men organizing social events or a fundraiser for charity will go to women it computer hardware installation repair specialized software working predominantly men but routine data entry predominantly women's uh, issue matter of union and management and you know hankering over wages and uh, conditions higgling haggling about that that normally goes to men so this is how you know a gender schema this is how a gender regime is formed in an uh, in an institution where men's work becomes starkly different from a woman's work the process of resisting the glass ceiling could entail some phased out forms of gender division of labor like occupational gender division of labor residual gender division of labor micro gender division of labor emergent gender divisions of labor like new technologies and labor processions can be the occasion for the creation of new gender divisions of labor you know like you just uh, when you even when you try to resist the glass ceiling and you take up a lot of measures you formulate a lot of rules you uh, uh, bring up commissions you bring up cells and uh, committees you know in spite of that just when you think that the battle is over newer technology newer uh, you know framework of newer framework of uh, activity brings in a new batch of problems that would again be entailed uh, class ceiling so it's a kind of dynamic problem gender inequality is simply a hangover from years of years of tradition on top of that sorry about the double comma gender relations are dynamic making way for newer sets of gender divisions of labor this is what i was saying just when you think that you've won the battle another new uh, glass ceiling comes up your way the arrival of women in public sector management has always been fraught with turbulence even with when women uh, succeed in breaking the glass ceiling and when they come into the uh, you know arena i would uh, use the term arena because it's a kind of, kind of like a, a workplace tussle that goes on you know it's always been very turbulent in what ways the collective memory of the study going back 30 years in some cases includes stories of bitter struggles of groups of women for access and by groups of men resisting the change like i said because the hangover of tradition is there women are supposed to be at home men are supposed to be outside so it's kind of like when women are trying to play, break the glass ceiling they are often seen as too big for their boots so that struggle is constantly there just as the wider indian culture is still not comfortable with women holding power over men women's authority in the public sector is still contested and debated in various ways even now the male section of society is not completely ready there are of course people who are why you know who are uh, how, what should i say i should not say large hearted that is a very awful term to use They, who are open enough liberal enough who are open enough to accept women as equals but there are large number of uh, men who still do not want to take orders from a woman so women's authority in the public sector is still contested and debated in various ways some critics of change think that women have moved up too fast they have lacked background and they have produced conflict so it's the fault of the woman because she has moved up too fast and she has produced conflict there are men who plainly have difficulty taking instructions from women and there are umpteen women who have as managers experienced particular resistance from men cases of sexual harassment is another ball game altogether but that also is something that prevents women from breaking the glass ceiling that often times women uh, you know take up jobs which will be uh, free from sexual harassment it is about women who are harassed that is who are the women who are harassed and by whom 
and it's not just that it's not about being harassed it's not just about being molested or uh, told a bad joke or given some pictures to be seen but it's about the power relations that are brought into play in the act of harassing it's always the harasser is always or rather that person always thinks that that person is in a hierarchy which is higher in power 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 dynamics about the objectification of women's bodies it's about the impact of, on women's identities it's about the impact on the confidence level of women in the organizational setting sexual harassment will diminish will you know just uh, undermine and set all, all the confidence of a woman on its head because she won't be able to be herself any longer but then steps are being taken so everything is not that dark so steps are being taken like women sell we have women sell everywhere now we have anti harassment regulations which are very very you know detailed and the parliamentary acts are brought into play there grievance cells are there equal chances in matters of promotions in some sectors like in our university you know equal chances in matters of promotions is something we don't really ask for we just take it for granted so that is there the creation of a depolarized workplace now a workplace which has been able to break through the gender inequality is normally known as the depolarized workplace that is a workplace where you don't have the polarization of men and women the principle of equal rights of women and men is evident uh, is evident in the international laws of the united nations discussed in the convention on the Elim uh, elimination of discrimination against women so things are actually looking up things are changing albeit slowly but they are changing but where the new style management includes many women or is led by women or where equal employment opportunity is used as a tool of organizational reconstruction resentment and distrust on one side and exasperation and anger on the other may develop along gender lines even if you take it for granted that the that the glass ceiling has been broken and you smile and accept it your heart might be resentful that is the case in a lot of places this could result in what could be termed the poisonous atmosphere in a workplace so there will be an undercurrent of animosity running subcutaneously though everything on the outer level would seem hunky dory and that is another big problem you're like sitting on a volcano emotions are often thought to belong to the private realm and not to be of no business of rational and goal oriented rationalization though we talk about emotional intelligence these days but emotions are normally uh, thought of as your personal affair and you're not supposed to uh, bring it out into your workplace however hern and parking in a 2001s and mill and tancred in 1992 in their study, they found in their close focus organizational research that there is abandoned, abundant evidence that emotions and emotional relationships are a significant part of organ, organizational life. Emotional connections and antagonisms are unquestionably a significant dimension of the gender regime. Gender culture, there are also transitions in the cultural dimension that concern the way in which a gender is understood spoken up uh, spoken of and dealt with wackman in 1999 study in the u.s yes uh, i have to interrupt you yes, um, participants are telling that the ppt's yes. are not changing you are you not changing the ppt's of course i am which they slide are, are you stuck on oh my god fixed. But uh, in the approach pioneered by Akner and Barton, this is the last slide. Yeah. Oh no. Wait, wait, wait. Let me go back. This is the last slide. No, then you're stuck a lot earlier. Oh dear. Yes, yes, yes. Did you see the broken glass uh, slide? Did you see the broken glass slide? No, you didn't. No. It's a slide that one that specifically organization create and reproduce gender divisions of labor, cultural definitions of masculinity and femininity that the Grant and Darkfield has commented. That one. That's the last slide. Oh that is showing. a lot earlier. Were you, were you being ah, able to listen one. to me? 
Yes. Your point is clear. Yes, yes, yes. You are perfectly audible. Yes, you are perfectly audible. But the so slides do you want me to go through clear. this? Slides, Akaran Burton is quite earlier. You know, I have come across a lot for a long way from there. So, or should I just uh, move off? Yes, but 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 still, you are uh, you please you please change the slide. The slides okay. are not changing till now. It's the same slide till Take now. Look. It is showing. Has it changed? You just go to the current slide that you are. No, it's no, no. It's not changed. Okay. Wait. No. Has it changed now? Has it changed now? No. It's in the slide, right? No. The slides are not changing. Okay, wait. The slides are not. I think you have to do it manually. Has it changed now? No. No. Has it now? No, no, no. I think you have to do it manually. Okay, then I have to over and I have the... to use my computer. Just bear with me a second then. Yes. Yes, I'll do that. Yes. I'll do that. Yes, yes, yes. Don't worry. Please. No issues. No issues. Yeah. So I'm still audible. Yes, you are perfectly audible. Great. Now see, has it changed? Has the slide no, changed? No. No, 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 no. What's going on? PPT is so much interesting that participants are telling that uh, they need the PPT. They're requesting me to share the PPT with them, but it's not changing till now. So <laughs> it's not changing till now. I think uh, you should stop sharing and you say, should I do you prefer me to do that? Yes, stop sharing and you okay. again um, share the screen. It will. Okay. To the okay. Need. Just give me a moment. And I apologize yes. for this uh, technological glitch, guys. It's uh, not in my hands. And I'm as new yes. to this as you are. Maybe you are. Yeah. <laughs> Just give me a second. <laughs> they are also telling that ma'am don't, ma'am doesn't need slides also. <laughs> really? <laughs> Okay. Uh, stop. Saying. The screen is not stopped. Okay. Come on. Okay. Share screen. The the cursor is frozen and the application window. No, it's. Share screen. screen. Yeah. Just no, I'm feeling so bad about this. Share screen, application window. Ah, share screen, application window. But then the application window should be showing uh, my PowerPoint. No, it is, not, it is not, it's showing. not uh, selected, but it's not acting now. OK, let me do it again. I'm very, very sorry, guys. Just bear with me one more moment. Or else you, you can continue also. You can continue also if you want. Are you sure? Yes, you, if the slides are not working, then you can continue also. Without the PowerPoint? Yes, without the PowerPoint, since it is not showing. Okay. What is showing there actually? Uh, there is a 
there is a, a slide where there is a picture of a glass ceiling with has okay, which okay, has okay, been okay, okay, okay. Uh, smattered to smithereens i would be very happy for people to see that. alternative <laughs> you can send the slide and uh, and that was I one slide that. that i very lovingly we just let me try one more time and if it doesn't happen then i'll go ah, 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 ah. yes it's good. can you see it now uh yes uh, yes 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 it's coming yes yes is the yes, glass yes. ceiling shattered at last yes 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 it's visible and it's shattered right the glass is shattered yes Yeah, yes, and you can see the yes. sky through that. And, and yeah. you can see the sky. Yes. Right, right, right. Yes. Just give me a moment. Yes. So the glass ceiling is shattered, and we can see the sky beyond that. Great. Yes. Okay. Yes. So continue where I, where I left off. Yes. So uh, like I said, the steps are being taken, and uh, we talked about all these things. Uh, I think I'll skip all these things. but then what i was talking about is just when we were beginning to be happy you know that the glass ceiling has shattered because we have women cell we have ribbon cells we have this and we have regulations then something else comes up which really is very disheartening and what is that but the new there is a resentment there's an interplay of negative emotions running subcutaneously subcutaneously underneath you know so so that like i was saying that the workplace becomes like a volcano and this is what is known as the poisonous atmosphere in the uh, in the in the in the workplace now emotions are often thought of to belong in the private realm we are not supposed to bring our emotions into the workplace but i remember that uh, when i was the dean of my university dean of arts of my university something had happened and i was very very passionate about getting that thing done and my be the then vice chancellor had uh, told me that you know when you come to the workplace you need to keep your emotions at home the workplace is only for the head it's not for the heart but you know emotions do run there subcutaneously you just can't help it however horn and parkin in 2001 and mills and tangred in 1992 found in their close focus organizational research that is abund that that shows abundance of evidence, evidence that emotions and emotional relationships are a significant part of organizational life emotional connections and antagonisms are unquestionably a significant dimension of the gender regime slide change ho chhe to gautam hello hello ha yes it's changing hello? yes it's changing okay, okay. ha hello ha right thank you yeah thank you thank you thank you so gender culture there are also transitions in the cultural dimension that concern the way in which gender is understood spoken up and dealt with you know there are different ways of dealing with the gender like there are different ways in which men behave with women or women behave with men now that comes into play a lot you know like wackman in 1999 study in the us cites an example of a group of manual workers whose transitional workplace solidarity had formerly been expressed you know whose solidarity camaraderie is expressed through uh, some very peculiar things what are they physical horse play you know slapping each other on the back slapping each other on the bum the use of pornography and inhibited swearing and sexist humor now what they said is the arrival of women in the workplace was felt as an inhibition to this so it's almost like it is an inhibition to their act of solidarity you know and because they felt it improper to swear in a woman's presence thereby curtailing their language and when they talk about curtailing their language they probably mean curtailing their freedom and they could not display the sexist images uh to a woman so the girly posters that they had put up uh, here and there they were relocated to the men's locker room and that even became a reason for resentment at another site a strongly defined masculine culture included a network of senior men based on drinking parties football clubs sometimes extending to the exchange of sexist humor in email messages now women this is really i don't know how to take this i at least i cannot take this in very good humor women could join in if they were good sports or willing to play along on the men's term 
so when there are sexist jokes when there are you know pornographic jokes women are invited to be they, they are invited to join in and if they join in then only are they good sports and if they demur then they are not good sports they are spoiled sports probably willing to play along on the men's terms the hegemony of these patterns is however challenged by a depolarized workplace so when there are women as equal in equal numbers as men are this kind of hegemony is naturally challenged and this uh, does not really set well with a group of people but reactions come in two ways one lords one kind of reaction lords applauds the question of justice equality and resistance to male chauvinism as fair and the other innately emphasizes tradition and tends uh, you know tends to think of depolarization and as an unnecessary charade you know uh, i don't want to get personal here but if i want to give a uh, an example from my personal life i have had many when men uh, who are colleagues saying you know too much of freedom always spoils a woman you know her actual place is in the kitchen and look at this woman she's driving cars she's going here and there so she's kind of like uh, cat's whiskers she's too big for her boots so that kind of attitude is also there still now collateral problems now we have already talked about the glass ceiling now there are other problems also there is a glass escalator now what is that the term glass escalator was introduced by christine l williams in her article the glass escalator hidden advantages for men in the pale professions published in 1992 adia harvey wingfield you know she's a black woman she discusses this in her research entitled racializing the glass escalator reconsidering men's experiences with women's work Andrew Conyard Black in 2012 examines the experience of men in teaching in riding the glass escalator to the principal's office sex of atypical work among token men uh, in the United States. Quite a mouthful of a title, but that's the title of his article. Now, what do we mean here? As more men join fields that were previously dominated by women, such as nursing and teaching, men are promoted and given more opportunities compared to women, as if men were taking escalators and women were taking the steps slower. This again leads to the diminishing of jobs for women on the basis of gender, because men are coming into the fields of job that were supposed to be women's uh, uh, fields uh, earlier, and then they are taking on and they are taking the escalator and they are uh, you know, outrunning the women and they are going on into the hierarchical higher positions in the same job. For example, while women have historically dominated the teaching profession, men tend to take a higher positions in the school system, such as deans or principals. Not always, but sometimes. The following chart from Caroline D. K. Bronner's Men, Women and the Glass Escalator. This is, of course, a US-based US chart. So you can see the gender, men as teachers, 24%, and women, 76%, fine. Principals. The number increases 49 percent and women are 51 percent so it's a kind of like a tie and then superintendents as superintendents men outrun women as 76 percent while women are uh, very eager 24 percent now another term that was there in my title and now i'm coming to that is a sticky floor now even if you outgrow uh, the glass ceiling if you break through the glass ceiling even if you manage to squeeze yourself into the uh, glass escalator sometimes the sticky floor is something that keeps you down it just doesn't let you take off at all so the sticky floor can be described as a pattern that women are compared to men less likely to start the to climb the job ladder at all now there is something also called the frozen middle like you take off even if you manage to take off from the sticky floor you get stuck in the middle what do i mean by that the frozen middle describes a phenomenon of women's progress up the corporate ladder, ladder or the academic ladder, all the administrative ladder, slowing down significantly, if not halting, in the ranks of middle management. Why does that happen? This is called, you know, the term was popularized, this uh, frozen middle was popularized in the middle management excellence. Uh, these are some studies. The norms of masculinity are used to assess, you know, sometimes, you know, when women go for higher hierarchical jobs, you know, their norms of masculinity are used to judge or assess women. Like, according to the study, women who did not exhibit stereotypical masculine traits like aggressiveness, 
thick skin this was not what i said but this was in the study you know so the, i'm just quoting thick skin lack of emotional experience expression and interpersonal uh, communication tendencies are at an inherent disadvantage so even if a woman has to go to the uh, you know upper ranks upper echelons of uh, job sector that woman has to exhibit some masculine traits like she has to be aggressive she has to be thick skin she has to be uh, she has to be more uh, you know intellectual probably as a as a binary to uh, emotional exp expression but you know as a woman i know that sometimes even when you are in uh, some of the to top ranks you know the opposites of aggressive uh, aggressiveness the opposites of thick skin empathizing also works wonders but sometimes, sometimes that is not taken into taken into account as the ratio of men to women increases in the upper levels of management women's access to female mentors also goes down because even if you manage to break the glass ceiling if you even if you manage to go out of the uh, frozen middle and you reach the top there you will find very few women that you can uh, find as a mentor this is why judith butler's gender trouble sought to uncover ways in which the very thinking of what is possible in gendered life is foreclosed by certain habitual and violent presumptions now there is something called the second shift women even when they are working in a very um, high ranking position i should be adjusted yeah when they are working in a very high ranking position you know they work second shift which means that they are working first shift in their uh, workplace they come back home and work second shift at home women often find themselves working a second shift once they get back home the second shift phenomenon has also been found to have detrimental physical effects as well for women who engage in longer hours in pursuit of anxiety other problems as a result all these things come up and these are very detrimental for a workplace now mommy track the mommy track is something that women are often a prey to what is that the american author and philosopher christina hoff somers describes the mommy track as the phenomenon of women who simply put their career and professional duties sorry for the i on the back burner on the back burner in order to satisfy the needs of their families especially their children some moms drop out of the workforce a few years after having children and thus take a hit to their experience and contacts like going back to my personal um, personal life once again i uh, did not apply for a second term of deanship because at that point of time my daughter was uh, at the brink of her higher second in of arts and i am the only uh, parent who's there with the child you know so i thought that i should be there at home with her after five at least so i just did not opt for de deanship which would have been a notch higher for me so some moms also drop out of the workplace a few years after having children because it uh, needs them to be at home uh, likewise if a woman knows she wants to have a big family in a few years she might join a lower paying job which allows her to leave at 5 pm each day instead of a higher paid one a more moneyed one that would demand more time in one group in a better balance uh, told npr that we often see women returning from maternity leave who are given less work or dead end assignments and this type of discrimination really drags down wages for women because they get off the track and even worse off and pushed out of the workplace you know they lose their edge they come back and they lose their edge this is something something that people say so the other factor that freezes women in the middle is a bad mommy syndrome that if i'm looking after my family my workplace too much and if i'm staying back even after the stipulated five uh, hour uh, work regime am i being selfish am i being negligent to my family to my child this bad mommy syndrome oftentimes take makes women let their careers take a beating when the winds of change that are already wafting in and all this will change towards a more depolarized welt and strong education is the catalyst for change of course and that's why you know we uh, try so hard to in, in, incorporate gender studies uh, in our syllabi in the women and women 
women's studies centers need to be brought up and uh, gender sensitization workshops like the one that uh, uh, Gautam is organizing right now are very, very useful for all these things. Now, institutional ratification, like I said, Foucault once said. Now, the question is, is it just a glass ceiling or is it a sticky floor too? Now, when I talk about the sticky floor, let's not look outwards. Let's look inwards, inside us, inside ourselves. Is there something wrong in the women themselves? Is it it's something inside themselves keeping them back? Is something wrong in our demeanor that stops us from ascending the organizational ladder? Is there something inside us that is encouraging the glass ceiling to be tougher, not easy to break? Are we ourselves convinced that we have the right leadership qualities? Are we ready to screw up the gumption not to back off whenever there's a confrontation, not to back off? Have we learned to assert ourselves? Do we have agency? Have we learned to grab agency? Now, some examples will tell you what I mean to say. In a meeting full of men, in a meeting room full of men, how many women speak up as much as they would have liked to? In an organization, when technical times do women a technical job, and I will go into it, and I will be at par with the men. Women normally take it quietly. How many times do women volunteer to go into technical jobs, thereby challenging the so-called normativity? How many times have women been able to stop telling themselves, oh, I must have been wrong then? We need to stop telling ourselves that. How many times have women been able to shout out their sexual harassment? There have been times when women have been sexually abused, harassed in the workplace, and then they just swallowed it and kept quiet, thinking this is not going to come into light because, first of all, I'm not getting, going to get justice. Secondly, people are only going to blame me. So how many times have people been able to shout out sexual harassment? Not yet, completely. Why? What holds us back? Ages of psychosocial conditioning. The same psychosocial conditioning that prompts men not to take women seriously, the same psychosocial conditioning that creates the glass ceiling is what keeps us stranded on the sticky floor, keeps us grounded there. Chris Whedon, you know, the famous author who wrote the book on uh, feminism and uh, um, post, uh, post uh, post-structuralist tradition to say that patriarchal relations are structural is to suggest that they exist in the institutions and social practices of our society and cannot be explained by the intentions good or bad of individual women and men even the institutional and institutions and social practices are kind of like gendered Simone de Beauvoir, the speaker before me, uh, I just joined at the last point, point of time and I, I could hear that she was rightly pointing out how, how uh, you know, Simone de Beauvoir always says that we are not born. I would also, I also, because we women probably take this as a catchword that we cannot, we swear by this. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman. This idea was picked up in 1957 by a Canadian American sociologist, Irvin Goffman, who argued that women are socially conditioned to present themselves as precious. I would request you to note the adjectives, precious, ornamental, fragile. You have to be, you know, very namby pamby very uh, precious, ornamental. You look good and you just stay put looking good. You are more seen than heard and you're fragile. You'll be scared at the slightest drop of a hat and you won't be, you know, courageous. You'll be fragile uninstructed in and ill-suited for anything requiring man's muscular exertion and to project shyness reserve and a display of frailty fear and incompetence now if this is these this is the gamut of adjectives instilled into the psyche of a, a woman how do we expect her to American uh, a study by American author Judith Butler in her book Gender Trouble? Again, this is another book that we cannot do without. She said a socially defined set of practices and traits that have over time grown to become labeled as feminine or masculine. Now, if we really look deeper, we will find that all the institutions institutions that we have around us in society pre-exist us. That is, we are born into them and we just accept the way they work 
as taken for granted. Yeah, uh, we just take over the prevalent ideas of patriarchy instructed normativity as glibly talked about how ideas, you know, uh, escalate from the individual to the society and from society to the individual. This is Yuri Bronfenbrenner, the Russian born. Uh, person, but he was an American. Uh, he lived in America. He talked about the sociological ecological systems theory, or which is also known as the human ecological theory in the ecology of human de development. Now, this is the um, chart. This is the uh, this is a picture that gives you an idea of what he meant to say in the ecological systems theory. So, if you can see my curve. Sir, if this is the individual, you know, the, he called the individual the micro system. Now, the individual is just in the middle of some concentric or rather a little elliptical circles. Now, this individual is there, and this if she's if she or he is the micro system, then just outside that there is the meso system, which is uh, which comprises of the home, parent, sibling, you know the the near, near about things that we are directly connected to schools teachers peers friends the church the temples the library the museum wherever we, we go directly then after that we have the exo system which is kind of like the next step the education policy the local school system mass media research about all these things the neighborhood that you are in and then all of these connect to make the macro system, which constitute the culture that you are born into. The socio-psychological instilling of culture happens from there. Now, when we talk about that, we really understand that women don't question their internal belief system. Now, if a girl is brought up, you know, I have seen this in my own life, and that's why I'm, I'm so assertive about this. I was taught that you should not talk back to your elders. Nobody told me that if your elders are saying something wrong, talk back to them politely, but yes, talk back to them. Now, this is one uh, piece, of, um, piece of advice that I grew up with, going back to the earlier slide. So then my micro system was influenced by this meso system, which constituted a greater macro system of how girls should behave. And so I never questioned this. You know, this uh, internal belief system was wired into my psyche and I took it for granted and I never questioned, questioned it. So women don't question their internal belief system that are so wired into their psyche that it's become a habit to take them for granted. Not to question them has become a habit. Factors that shape the feminine psyche are there. Fairy tales, you find the Namby Pamby princess who's, who can't even slap the person who kidnaps her but who will wait for eons for her prince to come and deliver her. So fairy tales, literature, films, family, society, all these things, you know, they act as what Foucault would be calling the panopticon of power. You know, the social moral policing about, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is structure of the panopticon. So society at times, you know, acts as the panopticon as the big brother who tells you how to behave. And we take that just unquestioningly, cement the phallocentric way very strongly. You know, we look at everything in a male gaze. That habit always, you know, makes us think about what the what people will think if I act in a certain way, what people will talk about if people will talk behind my back, if I work, uh, work or talk or walk or sit in a certain way. So we are always under the male gaze. That's, that is something that even the women cannot, uh, you know, grow out of. Now, this is what creates our gender schema. Now, gender schema is a theory which was formulated by Sandra Ruth lipsitz Bem. Now, what she said is that, uh, you know, introduced by Sandra, uh, I told you that. Okay, what she says, this... Uh, it has an effect on how individuals become gendered in society, how sex-linked characteristics are maintained and transmitted to other members of the same culture, 
Gender schema theory, as act, uh, articulated by BIM, has used in uh, 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 used to explain the preferential recall of stereotype behavior, the importance of cultural factors in understanding, interpreting, and remembering gender has a long history. So, what is the gender schema? What, how does it look like? If you want to get this, this is a very ready-made kind of um, format that I got on the internet. So, I just copied and pasted it for you. So, so this is a very nice one that shows how gender schema is, you know, it has all of this. Society's belief about the traits of females and males, it influences you. And what you are, again, again influences the process of uh, social information, which makes it a vicious cycle and influences on self-esteem. So society tells you how to be, how you should behave, and then you go back and tell society how, how to behave. And you say the same thing back to society. So it becomes a vicious cycle. So this is how the self schema is made. Um, uh, Gautam, how much more time do I have? I'm trying to rush because I think I'm outstaying my, my welcome. Can I take five minutes more, Gautam? One minute. Uh, yes, please. Within yes. five minutes, please, please to continue. Absolutely, absolutely. I won't outstay my yes. welcome before okay, you kick okay. me out. So I'll try to, uh, okay, uh, you know. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this is uh, Eric Homberger Erickson's uh, Stages of Psychosocial Development. I'm not going into that. This is a completely different discourse. So if I start talking about it, I won't be able to stop. So this is James E. Marcia, who talked about the four types of identity. Now, these are the four types of identity. Identity foreclosure, identity achievement, diffusion, and moratorium. Now, identity achievement is the ones who have already settled upon an identity the happy ones who know who what they want to be and they have become what they want it to be identity moratorium is one who the ones who are still searching for an identity identity foreclosure is ones who have had their identities decided by someone else and identity diffusion is ones who haven't yet even begun the process of identity formulation now especially in the in the context of india you will find that these three identity moratorium identity foreclosure and identity diffusion is what comes into the lot of women unfortunately factors influencing a girl's behavior is later carried forward into her womanhood you know what she learns as a girl is something she carries with her into her womanhood and heaven help her if she is influencing other little girls with that the same kind of uh you know mindset and the same kind of um, the, the same factors sandra l gilman uh, made a very interesting observation in her book this book is a very a beautiful book i love this book you know i loved reading it making the body beautiful a cultural history of aesthetic surgery talks of indivisibility visibility and in parenthetized visibility now what does she mean by invisibility what does she mean by visibility and what does she mean by invisibility the body subjects lived experience is characterized by efforts to sustain invisibility and hence flow in motor action and social interaction sandra gilman's concept of passing is used to understand this idea passing as gilman indicates is a type of silent validation where one is accepted without comment okay i'll just rush through this i won't really go through all this what she means to say is that you know uh, that when we are in society we want to be a part of uh, as we uh, we i mean women we want to be a part of society but we don't want to attract extra attention towards ourselves otherwise we feel like a freak so we want to be invisible in that way Again, since we want to be in the flow, that's why we want to be visible. This visibility and invisibility rolled up into one is what for Sandra Gilman makes the concept of in parenthetized visibility, invisibility. I'm rushing through this because both of yes, us yes, given yes, me yes, the yes, yes, ultimatum. Yes. Yes. One, one, yes, one piece of advice that I want to give to unlearn what has been drilled into the psyche is terribly difficult. But there is only one way out to forget all that harangue about how to be a good girl or a good woman, to train yourself to be the bad girl or the bad woman. Now, I would like to wind up with the five chairs theory. Now, Louis Evans, 
talked about she has a book called five chairs five choices now she talks talks about five chairs which bear five colors now these colors each color you know signifies or stands for a definite kind of way of behavior that def definite way of going through life like the red chair is called the red jackal chair which shows exasperation anger which stands for rather exasperation anger attacking from i am a right i am right perspective remember i said women need to understand that she is not always wrong now i am right perspective judge and punish yellow hedgehog chair that is that is full that is that stands for negative thoughts repenting actions feeling vulnerable judging oneself feeling like nobody loves me nobody believes in me i'm not intelligent enough green meerkat chair you know you've seen a meerkat how vigilant it is all the time so it's like hold your horses take it easy relax be vigilant mindful observant and then pounce when your chance comes blue dolphin chair hoping things will turn out fine we have possibilities to grow become powerful but okay things are going to turn out right and the purple giraffe chair you know because the giraffe is supposed to be having the longest neck and the largest heart among all land animals that's why this chair is called the giraffe chair this is called the connect chair also and it stands for you thinking about what is important for the other person empathizing with the other person communicating positively seeing the other side the other perspective in this chair we becomes we become empathizing compassionate uh, and uh, you know the ego needs to go on the back burner understanding tolerant unfortunately women are always taught or they are always taught to ex ex expected to sit on the purple giraffe chair with the yellow chair as backup but what those are not the ones she needs to reach out for she needs to be re she needs to reach out for the red chair the green chair and the blue dolphin chair somebody needs to tell her that it's okay to be angry it's okay to wait for opportunities and pounce on them it's just okay to be vigilant and powerful it's okay to be assertive it's okay to be yourself thank you gotam ha ah, yes yes i'm there so the it's wonderful presentation and the i just want to tell you that so many questions are there so many questions are there but not able to take all the questions because um, all the other speakers are also in the pipeline yeah. so the, i think that uh, i'm the also trying to um, connect it with the current scenario and i think that the covid 19 Measures adopted over the last four months have massively increased the amount of housework and for the childcare also. So this kind of extra True. burden uh, is going to disturb the, the second, relationship within the, the second, couple also. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yeah, yes. 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 And the, the I think uh, the the I think that the extra uh, uh, work uh, is a burden uh, mainly. born by women and covid 19 has the potential to be a to be a disaster for the equality and the, fam the family systems are also regressing to more more traditional norms due to the closure of schools day to day uh, day care centers and the summer camp so the, i think the family systems are also regressing and this pandemic can dilute the uh, decades of advancement of, on gender equality do you also think like that i think women need need to hold their ground if women know how to put their foot down nothing can shove them apart you know okay. so women are taught to be malleable women are taught to be very pliable that is what i wanted to say they are always taught to sit on the giraffe chair they need to understand yes. that it is okay to say yes i want this and i i need this and i will get this that's it so women seldom put their foot down they need to that's what i think yes yeah. okay this so um, thanks a lot thanks a lot for speaking to us on gender sensibilities and basically on women issues and i am sure that the listeners who attended this is, uh, session 
really enjoyed your presentation and particularly all the theoretical intervention it's uh, and all are requesting me to uh, send uh, uh, to tell you that i need the ppt and that i that i have to upload it in the telegram group also since you have mentioned so many books and we appreciate you and for making time uh, in your busy schedule to speak to us and thank you one second for your time you did such a great job for us thank and this what i needed the actually that you have just set the momentum for this whole program i just loved it and i have had nothing you. but glowing comments about your presentation in the chat box both the pictures and the commentary so you were a natural speaker thanks thanks yes. a lot just make, make sure to send those uh, screenshots to me so that i can yes. look at the questions <laughs> and, yeah i look at the questions answer them and also be happy at the com compliments so okay, thank okay. you once again go thank you for inviting me and all the best for the rest of your webinar thanks a lot thank you so but now um, i'm um, going to introduce you to all professor smita agarwal ma'am she um, she is the professor of english at the uh, university of belarabad and she is a professor and apart from that she was the former director of the center for the women studies at the same university she is an, an an indian poet writing in english she is an editor she is a professional singer and she is a well known cultural person her poems have been curated in magazines journals and anthologies published from india and abroad and in my recently published anthology the lie of, of the land um, an anthology of indian poetry in english that is published by shaitra academy uh, smita mems poems are there and she is a naturally born poet and now i am requesting smita mem to deliver her talk what yes, is a naturally yes. born poet gotham <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh, since we've you know overshot the time so yeah. let me begin uh, first of all i want to thank dr chandrakant pande chief patron of your college uh, shri rupa mahanalabis your head of the department and of course dr gautam karmakar uh, for inviting me to take part in this uh, faculty development program and uh, i'm going to be speaking on gender issues in indian poetry in english so when i talk of gender issues then obviously we have to take a look at the historiography of the word gender now uh, when i was growing up in the late 60s when i must have been in class 6 uh, or 7 and when sanskrit was a compulsory language to be learned in school gender in those days was a word that was used in connection with languages in sanskrit we had the masculine feminine and the neuter gender and you know we sort of uh, we were taught in a formal way of how in hindi if you are talking about a river the river is going to be a female and then there is you know in hindi if you are talking about a, an umbrella a chata it's going to be a male and then we also learned by and by that in it is not necessary that if in one language uh, chata is male then in the other language chata cannot be female and there was this big joke in school that we used to laugh at that there was this you know uh, bu bureaucrat who told his servant on a rainy day ke um ha uh, hamara chhata pakdo aur mem sahab ki chhati pakdo because probably in bengali chhata or chhati uh, chhata uh, is female so that's how you know we were conversant with the term gender that it is related to uh, languages and recently just two or three days back i was participating in an international discussion on translation where i learned to my utter surprise that italian doesn't have a neutral gender so as of now in contemporary times people translators and writers in italian 
uh, are in great confusion as to how to you know give a gender to transgenders or to those people who are in between genders how are these categories to be expressed in italian if they don't have a neuter gender so that was our conventional or our traditional way of the understanding of the term gender that is something related to languages and associated with words then in 1955 there was a sexologist an american sexologist called john money who introduced the terminology terminological difference between sex and gender and it is then that we came to differentiate between sex as a biological given and gender as a social construct now all of you who have participating in this program today perhaps this may sound very simple to you people because you people have already read up a lot about sex and gender but there is this book written by kamla bhaseen published by kali for women in 2000 it's written so clearly so lucidly and it clarifies this concept between sex and gender so well the title of the book is understanding gender and the other book that is already referred to uh, not the book but the writer is already referred to in the concept note of this faculty development program that is uh, judith butler's gender trouble feminism and the subversion of identity which was published by rutledge in 1990 judith butler describes gender as a role as an enactment as a performance that is society and culture create and describe how we should behave how we should act when we are circumscribed within a certain gender you know and this leads us to stereotypes because what are stereotypes they are unchanging patterns of behavior so if society has conditioned a girl child to behave in a certain manner then that becomes a stereotype or an unchanging pattern that generations of girl children are then expected to follow so we have to adopt and adapt to these stereotypes in order to fit into that gender so if one is born a girl one is taught from the moment that she is born that you have to be coy you have to be passive you have to be adjusting and if you are born a boy you are given certain leeway and you are told okay you can be demanding you can be aggressive you can be idealistic so in a way how we walk how we talk how we sit how we shake hands how we smile it is all decided by the society and the culture that we live in now this understanding of gender as something gender roles being created by society this understanding of gender became widespread in the 1970s when the feminist movement very gladly appropriated the term and took it to mean as a distinction between biological sex and the social construction of gender so this is just the background which other uh, uh, speakers before me have also elaborated upon and spoken about and from that background now we will move to uh, gender in indian poetry in english now we all know that all art concerns itself with human expression so naturally gender issues play a prominent role and an eminent role in all art in modern indian painting we see how bhupen kakkar started expressing his gay identity in his paintings of men 
gazing at men. In modern Indian poetry in English, we have Vikram Seth and Hoshang Merchant and Aga Shahid Ali, who unabashedly embrace their gay identity. But the lesbian writing in Indian poetry in English is still very muted. Maybe we have Ruth Vanita, we have Suniti Nam Joshi. But are there any anthologies of lesbian poetry in English from India? So you see, these are the various questions regarding uh, poetry in English from India and gender that come into play in the mind when we start focusing on this topic. Now, if for the purposes of convenience, uh, we take uh, 1827, the publication of Henry de Rosio's The Harp of India as the starting point of, say, uh, Indian poetry in English. We have a tradition of writing poetry in English of, say, about 200 years. That is a fair enough time for us to have a sufficient body of work to analyze from the speculum or the lens of gender. So let us come to Torudat, to the late 19th century, who was writing poetry from within India in English. Now she was coming from a, literal, a literate cosmopolitan background. She was inspired by British learning. There was a lot of talk about Indian nationalism going on at that moment. Torudat was proficient in Sanskrit, in Bengali, in English, and in French. And in her ancient legends and ballads of Hindustan, which was published in 1882 by Kegan and Paul of London, we see that Torudat, in dealing with mythological figures, is giving a place of eminence to, in her poem, she's giving a place of eminence to women characters, strong women characters like Sita, like Uma, like Savitri. And thus, she has already started challenging the stereotype of the coy, obedient, you know, Indian woman, uh, which our culture was glorifying at that moment. In Savitri, written by Torudat, uh, Torudat takes up the cause of widowhood. There is a portion, there are some lines in that poem where she makes Yam describe the state of widowhood to Savitri. And Yam tries to scare her off by saying, and think upon the dreadful curse of widowhood, the vigils, the fasts, and the penances, no life is worse. So in writing these lines, we see how Torudat is bringing the plight of Hindu women, particularly Hindu widows in colonial India. She is bringing them center stage in her poem. And here I would like to digress a little bit just to juxtapose something for your easy understanding. And I want to refer to a contemporary take on Savitri by a poet called Deepa Agarwal. When she says in her poem, she says, Deepa Agarwal says this ironically and satirically. And listen to the lines. She says, Savitri, constant wife, faithful lover, woman of power, you conquered death. Yet, your womb was too narrow. Yet, your womb was too narrow. It could only hold 
a hundred sons, not a single daughter. So, you know, this is a contemporary take on Savitri. And this is a poem titled Thoughts on a Ritual written by Deepa Agarwal. And this has been published in a Sahitya Academy pub publication called We Speak in Changing Languages. This was published in 2009. It is an anthology of verse from India. Then let us come to Sri Aurobindo and his long, long magnus opus, magnum opus called Savitri. Now just see, Aurobindo's Savitri breaks all stereotypes of Abla Nari, all stereotypes of women being victim and women being ineffectual. In fact, Aurobindo's Savitri becomes a symbol of enlightenment. She becomes a symbol of the supreme mind that is yogic, that is focused, that is able to achieve transformation and liberation. Then from Sri Aurobindo, let us come to Sarojini Naidu. And Sarojini Naidu is an interesting because she is a bridge between colonial India and independent India. Therefore, her poetry and her personality become an interesting case in point. Her earlier poems are lush and lyrical poems where her women are coy, they are obedient, they are submissive, they are meek. And all these portraits she is painting in her poems, while her own, while Sarojini Naidu's own human personality is undergoing a dramatic change and converting Sarojini Naidu's personal life into that of a champion of the cause of women in her speeches, in her letters, and in her political life. So while she herself is transforming into a very strong and independent and empowered woman in her social life, in her literary expression, in her earlier poems, she is painting a very different picture of Indian womanhood. Then towards 1917, the publication of her last collection of poems called The Broken Wing. In this collection, we read her very strong love poems, fearlessly expressing, not in as much female sexuality, but certainly, certainly, certainly female desire. These poems centering around her love interest, her mentor, her political mentor, Gopal Krishna Gokhale. She is forthright in these poems about pangs of love. Sometimes Sarojini Naidu is angry in love. Sometimes Sarojini Naidu is wishing the loved one dead so that she, she can free herself of this suffocating bond. Sometimes she is pliant. Sometimes she is a supplicant full of idealism and surrender in love. Her love poems are certainly gendered. And they subvert and they dent the stereotypes of a silent, submissive and forgiving woman. woman. So this is the modernizing aspect of Sarojini Naidu's poetry, her frank delineation and assessment of female desire, these direct, passionate, forthright, intense poems at the end of her career in her last book, paving the path ahead for, say, a woman poet like Kamla Das, who will then begin writing her type of poetry in the 1960s. 
Now, I will give you some example from these last love poems of Sarojini Naidu that I am talking about, just to clarify my point. There is a poem called The Path of Tears. It is in seven sections and it has the lines. Why did you turn your face away? Why did you turn your face away? Was it for grief or fear? Then there is a poem called The Menace of Love, where she says, All the sealed anguish of my blood shall taunt you. See, she's, she's uh, uh, castigating the lover here. All the sealed anguish of my blood shall taunt you in the rich menace of the red flowering trees. The yearning sorrow of my voice shall haunt you in the low wailing of the midnight seas. Then there is a poem called The Worship of Love, where she says, Crush me, O love, between thy radiant fingers like a frail lemon leaf or a basil bloom. And then... <clears throat> There is this poem called Devotion, where she says, Take my flesh to feed your dogs if you choose. Just listen to the language. Just look, look at the language. So different from palanquin bearers and bangle sellers. Okay, the sharp contrast. Take my flesh to feed your dogs if you choose. Water your garden trees with my blood if you will. Turn my heart into ashes, my dreams into dust. Am I not yours, O oh love, to cherish or to kill? So here, all that Victorian sensibility, all that romanticism of her earlier verse has been totally abandoned. And she's sounding more like the bhakti poets, the women bhakti poets, you know, who talk one and one with God, their lover. She is sounding more like Mirabai rather than some, you know, prettified uh, 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 Victorian poet. Now, uh, after Sarojini Naidu, I would like to come to uh, contemporary times. And here I will have to uh, screen share. And so now there is, there might be a bit of confusion, but uh, you also uh, screen share, right? So first I, uh, uh, yeah, that's already open. Screen share, Gautam? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Share screen. Share screen, yes. Again, share you have to screen. share the screen. Then I have to, where is this? Application window, right? Yes, right? application window, yes. Application window. Then and you have to click on that. Yeah, then I have to then click I've, on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've clicked it here and I am sharing. So can you all yes. see something? You all can see something, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. You can yes. see hands, which is a poem written by Pervin Saket. Pervin Saket is a contemporary uh, 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 young woman writing. She has not published a book as yet, but her poems have been published in various anthologies and on the internet. And uh, this is a poem called Hands by Pervin Saket. And this poem, which you all can start reading while I'm discussing, this poem deals with gender and violence patriarchy and violence and sexual abuse. Now, before I say anything, I want you to look at the visual representation of the poem. Okay? Just see how the poem is in two columns. It is in two columns. There is that deliberate blank space in the middle. And the poem is shaped like hands. Okay. Maybe not artistically so, but the uh, poet has tried to give it 
the shape of hands. Now, if you read the poem, you will see that it is a poem about sexual abuse, first by the father's hands and then by the husband's hands. The column on the left side reads, her father's hands are nothing like her mother's. And this is mirrored by the column on the right hand, which says her husband's hands are nothing like her mother's. The Both the sides of the poem show us the domino effect of sexual abuse, the ripple effect of sexual abuse, how the victim is unable to get out of the circle of abuse because the perpetrator of that sexual abuse is a close relation. And the title, Hands. Hands are the tools, the instruments of the abuse. The sexual abuser is first the father and then the husband. The abuse damages and dehumanizes the victim by rendering her into an object. And you have to consider the split, the fragmented, the twinned, the ruptured, and the mirroring structure of the poem. The poet has done this deliberately, that the form and content of the poem mirror each other. Okay, So the structure mirrors the repetition of the cycle of abuse, the rupture, the damage in the psychology of the individual. So this is a good poem to look at and to discuss when we have to discuss gender and violence uh, and the rupture and the break in the typographical structure also echoes a psychological rupture the trauma and the fragmentation of the woman's psyche so we don't have time, otherwise we would have read these two poems side by side and then the whole understanding becomes all the more interesting. However, I will leave it there because uh, I'm sure Gautam will people be able to see this text after the lecture is over? Yes, yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, okay. Lecture will so be there. Then they, yeah, yeah, then they can look at it and you know read the poem with the few inputs that I have provided. Now I'm going to share another screen. And can you see Advaita, the ultimate question on the screen? No, ma'am. It's still Parvin Saket. OK. So what do I do now? I have to first I have to shop, stop sharing the first one, right? Yes. Yes. OK. OK. Uh, uh, so I've stopped sharing that. Now can you see something? No, no. you haven't shared till now. You have to share yeah. the second one that you want to share now. Okay, 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 okay. So I go to share screen again, right? And then I yeah. say share screen, and then I say application window. Window, huh? yes. Yes. And hands was there. No, where is the other one? Where is this one? Can you see something now? No, you haven't no. shared. Okay. okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry very much. I'm just getting to it. Hands, gender. This thing is open here. Why isn't it coming? Okay, just wait, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Yes, it's there huh? now. Huh? What, what no. is that? No. Uh, they are the documents library. Um, no, it is not no, that one. No, I don't want to sh share that. I want to share. Uh, uh, okay. Why is it saying 
stop sharing so everything has been now i have to open this this is open and okay please bear with me like you bore so patiently <laughs> <laughs> professor hazra i'm sorry <laughs> uh share screen share screen and uh, uh application window and why what is coming on this stupid application window this is open here and this is open here then why am i not getting no it? it's not coming maybe i have to yeah. close this parveen saket yes now maybe. have you seen now no seen? Now, no 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 okay okay so just wait let me close everything and start again from the beginning so yes. and go here and the issues text let it open okay once it's open let me go down to what i want but wait at the ultimate question this is open now i have to minimize this window and start sharing again na no? yes okay now share screen application god oh, what has happened oh. i'm so sorry about that okay um should i just start reading the poem because i can see some faces yes, yes, yes. very very bored hmm? so uh, <laughs> this poem uh wait ha ha it's coming what has come no 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 ma'am okay, okay ma'am you please go ahead with uh, you huh. just read just wait just wait just wait yes yes, uh, yes. share screen share screen Can you see something? No. Ma'am, kindly go ahead. With okay. So there is this poem written by Meena Kanda Swami, and it's yes. called Advaita, the Ultimate Question. Okay. Now, in this poem, she takes up gender issues of caste and religion, and she brings them into focus. She actually interrogates Brahminical patriarchy in this poem. i'll just read it out this poem is also in two columns okay and it's called uh, advaita the ultimate question non dualism atma self brahman god are equal and same so i untouchable outcast am god will you ever agree no matter what you preach your answer will always be the same preach your answer to me through your saints one more final question can my untouchable atma and your brahman atma ever be 
वन एंड द पोएम एंड ऑन अ क्वेश्चन मार्क शोइंग द रीडर दैट दीज टू इशूज आर इर रिकनसाइलेबल एंड दे आर इमेज इन द स्ट्रक्चर अगेन लाइक द परवीन साकेत पोएम हियर ऑल्सो दिस इज अ पोएम इन टू कॉलम्स so you imagine that non is one column dualism is another and there is a whole lot of white space in between this poem is readily available on the internet so if you all go later and type advaita the ultimate question it will come up and you can see the text of the poem as the poet intends it to be and in order to show the uh, 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 the uh, irreconcilability of caste and gender questions uh in order to interrogate brahmanical patriarchy uh the poet writes the text of this poem in this particular fashion after that we will go to uh some two recent poems by vivek narayan which have been published just say 10 days ago in granta these are poems about ahilya and ahilya we all know is the uh, woman from the ramayan who because she committed a sexual transgression as such therefore she was punished by her husband to become a pillar of stone and it is only when lord ram came on that route and then he blessed her and she was reconverted back into a woman so that is the uh, uh, legend of ahilya as it is told in the ramayan so ahilya is actually an example of you know a patriarchal stereotype of a woman that if you commit some kind of a sexual transgression then this is how you will be punished for your sexuality and ahilya is also an example of gender and effacement of how if the woman uh, exceeds her bounds then she is completely effaced and she becomes a pillar of stone she doesn't exist at all as a person because she has uh, this is the way that society has decided to punish her but uh, so uh, uh, ahilya being a patriarchal stereotype she is punished for her errant moral behavior okay now narayan looks at this from the woman's perspective and interrogates ahilya's negative subsistence as he calls it okay hers has been a negative subsistence as a stone pillar for years and years ahilya has been rendered voiceless she is unable to express herself and she is completely effaced but in vivek narayan's poems two poems two short poems on ahilya that are readily when you if you type on the internet vivek narayan granta ahilya poems they'll come up okay they'll show up so uh, in in these two short poems even though ahilya is punished and she has a negative subsistence nevertheless it is an existence and it is an existence in absentia by not being there it is a non existence so powerful that it is talked about written about and brought to life in being talked about and written about and her non existence becomes as powerful as her liberator lord 
Ram. Narayanan says in the poem, this isn't a poem about Indra. It's about Ahilya's invisible living on air and sleeping in the ashes. Even in her negative subsistence, Ahilya is empowered. In conclusion, Narayan subverts the patriarchal stereotype and empowers Ahilya as a dominating, overarching presence, even in absentia. So with these words, I would like to uh, end my talk. I can only deeply apologize for this share screen working for one and not working the other time. I wonder why. Uh, you see, we are all learning on the job. Uh, and uh, I hope you all found whatever I said, you all found it interesting. And those of you interested in Indian English poetry will go ahead and research into some things that I have highlighted during my talk. And I once again thank everyone for having me here. Uh, thank you so and much. And then, uh, broadly speaking, ma'am, that uh, your talk, ma'am, that uh, reveals that the many women writers in English have reached a remarkable height of achievement also. And they have understood the technique, the tone, the craft, and the structure, and have applied those in their writings. And not only they have to, uh, chosen the themes like male counterpart, but they have chosen the themes like the uh, giving special importance to the role of women also. And um, um, I think that they have understood the, 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 the very basic problems and the predicaments that have, uh, um, that have come in the way of the progress of women. So their works, uh, as well as your work also, um, reveals the various aspects of modern women's feeling and exhibit the fully awakened uh, feminine sensibility and uh, feminist views also. Um, but, uh, women like you are bold, frank, and have shown um, a realistic, a realistic attitudes towards love and men-women relationship and other social issues pertaining with women and special agenda issues. So I think that you all have created a special niche um, for uh, for yourself uh, in the area of Indo-English literature and your achievement and the achievement of other women poets are evidently remarkable and they have gained an outstanding place in the uh, in the arena of indian english women poetry so ma'am um, thanks a lot for your wonderful wonderful deliberation and the comments are just glowing there and few of them are also interested to go with indian english women poets and um, uh, particularly ma'am uh, there are two questions can i take one question Yes, please. Please go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. I'm just uh, taking uh, one question that um, someone is telling that um, um, Indian academia and feminist writers in India seem reluctant in taking up the subject of Dalit women. They have been deliberately sidetracked by the mainstream writers. And um, Meena Kandasam is popular among overseas people, but why not so much research work is going on on Meena Kandaswami in India? What will be your I, take on? Uh, my take is that, yes, perhaps in academia, so much of the research work is not going on. Because you see, in academia, what we suffer from is a lack of the availability of material. So maybe in our traditional orthodox universities, like say Allahabad Central University, here maybe a lot of research work is not going on on women Dalit writers. But let me tell you, in these in other universities, the private universities are doing a lot of work, and universities in Maharashtra are doing a lot of work on Dalit literature. Lot of work is happening on Dalit literature, especially women writers in Hyderabad. So in the South, a lot of work is going on. And if you get connected to some kind of a poetry circle, which uh, you know covers all of India, then your mind opens up and then you move out of 
this uh, uh, university threshold. You break new ground. So it's just, and a lot of uh, discussion is going on on the internet, on blogs, on internet magazines. So I will not take this. I will not take this. Maybe in my university, maybe in your university, work is not being done on women Dalit writers. But how has an old fogey like me come to know about it? And how am I discussing it with you with white hair on my head? Because a lot is happening over the internet. So it's just, you know, how you make those connections. And there's a lot. There's one um, Dalit writer from Hyderabad, Bangalore. Chandra Mohan S. His works are being published internationally. So there is a lot of writing. I think you just need to get the find the right path. Yes. Ma'am, there is another and question. It, yeah, yeah. Yes, and that um, is it possible for you to elaborate on the first instance you cited about the gender roles on the shaping the grammar of Sanskrit? Because it seems that the word words with short vowels like ah, dear, etc. are attributed to men and the long ones are to women. And moreover, the structure and the understanding of grammar in Sanskrit is a very complex one. Yes. And the question is, is it really for the benefit of patriarchy that such construction of grammar in Sanskrit has been made? Because apart from Chata and Nodi, all the words of Sanskrit should adhere to such construction. So what will be your take on it? Yeah, my answer to this is that you have uh, your question is excellent. You have really thought, thought it through very well. But I need to apologize to you. I'm not a linguist. You know, I am a literature person. So my knowledge of Sanskrit is very basic. And I just brought these, this point up in my discussion just to say that when we were young in the 60s, uh, our understanding of gender was gender in Sanskrit, okay, or any other language, masculine, feminine, napunsak gender, and this, that. So I was just making the distinction of how earlier on gender was con connected to languages and then when the feminist movement took root and became very strong, gender started meaning the social construction of gender. That is all I was trying to say. Whereas your question, yes, there, undoubtedly Sanskrit is a Brahminical language and undoubtedly Sanskrit is a patriarchal language. So, so maybe if intense research is done, then what you are saying may hold up to be true. But I'm not a linguist. I'm not a specialist in languages. So I will not go there. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks, ma'am. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your wonderful so, deliberation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Gautam. You are yourself a champion to the cause of Indian poetry uh, in English. You do a lot of research on it. You uh, are, are taking this uh, area of uh, writing forward because we need readers and researchers like you otherwise Thanks. we are writing in a vacuum so poets writing in english in india need readers and researchers like you thank you very much for the effort that you put in and thank you everyone for listening in and uh, you know bearing up with me despite <laughs> all the technical glitches so thank you very much bye bye have a good time bye bye Okay, so um, now uh, we are moving toward um, um, the second session that will be cheered or that will be delivered by Dr. K. A. Gita, uh, who is the Associate Professor of English Literature, Language and Cultural Studies, Bits Goa Campus, India. And she has nearly two decades of experience uh, in teaching different modules in English Literature, Language and Cultural Studies. And she has been working in BITS Goa campus from 2010. Her research interests are Dalit writing, post-colonial uh, literatures, cultural studies, and women's studies. So I'm expecting a lot of questions from on Dalit studies. And basically, I have gone through your article published in Taylor and Francis journals. Those are wonderful. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk. 
It's all yours. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, at the outset, uh, yes, yes. am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Chandra Kanta Panda, Dr. Sri Rupa Mahalanabi, and in particular, Dr. Gautam Karmakar for inviting me for this uh, seven day international online faculty development program on gender sensitization. Uh, I'm thankful to the previous speaker, Professor uh, Smita Agarwal. It was a, a very significant uh, a talk, and it it actually serves as a yeah. fitting prelude to what I'm going to discuss. And I'm also thankful uh, for the question uh, that was asked: that why is um, um, I mean why is Dalit literature or Dalit women writing not much uh, researched upon? Um, and then uh, she said that it's going on in the south, and I would uh, I would like to say that I'm from the south, and uh, I've worked on uh, Dalit literature. I've worked on Tamil Dalit literature. So uh, this talk, uh, which I'm going to give, is actually going to focus on uh, the interconnectedness of caste and gender structures. The previous speaker, Professor Agarwal, was, uh, was discussing how uh, societal norms uh, shape women's life, women's identity. So I'm going to elaborate on that. And uh, I'm going to uh, discuss how caste ideologies uh, uh, shape uh, female uh, subjectivity and identity, but in particular, I'm going to uh, discuss the intersectional oppression of uh, Dalit women who are uh, doubly oppressed, not only on the basis of caste, but also on the basis of gender. All right. <clears throat> While discussing the origin and perpetuation of the caste system in India, Baba Sahib Ambedkar posits that caste system is a structure of graded inequality, inequality, that is premised on the religious ideologies of purity and pollution and emphasizes that without the practice of endogamy, the caste system cannot survive. Now, elaborating on Ambedkar's theory, anthropologist and feminist scholar Leela Dubey points out that the caste system is premised on the regulation and control of female sexuality. So this is the kind of connection that is there between the caste structure and the gender structure and how endogamy is very, very important and how women are very important, how women play a very pivotal role in continuing in the, in the, in the perpetuation and in the continuation of the caste system itself, which has sustained for so many centuries. Marriage and sexuality constitute a central arena in which caste impinges on women's lives. When there is within caste a hierarchy between the sexes, okay? The concerns of purity and impurity along the gender divide have an inverse relationship with the ritual of caste. Now, we all know that the caste system itself is premised on the notions of uh, uh, purity and pollution. The higher the caste, the more purer the, uh, the caste uh, uh, community is. And, the low, and, and within the caste hierarchy, the lower the caste, the more polluted they are. All right, so this is also played out within the gender structure. That is what is being pointed out over here. How is it pointed out? This is very interesting. Why are, um, I mean, how is it, how the norms of purity and pollution are played out within the gender structure? Now, Leela Dubey points out that periodical pollution through menstruation and widowhood had rendered women less intrinsically impure than men. So we are intrinsically impure because of certain biological functions, OK? And of course, once a woman is a widow, she's, uh, she's again becomes a uh, epitome of pollution. This is also something that, uh, though of course it is not uh, played out that obviously in contemporary times, but the, uh, but the ideologies continue to haunt uh, widows, OK? So periodical pollution through menstruation and widowhood had rendered women less intrinsically impure than men. So we are intrinsically impure. There's a lot of uh, debate. Uh, I mean, there are so many examples that we can give. Uh, the Shabri Mala issue or the Shani Shingapur issue, all these are actually related to this, to this uh, underlying ideology that women are inherently polluted because we go through what is called a menstrual cycle, which is a biological function, all right? But this is the paradox. This is the irony. In spite of being intrinsically impure, Nevertheless, within a family, a girl's modesty is pivotal in maintaining caste purity. So a caste purity is actually synonymous with a woman's purity. 
So despite being um, uh, not being pure, okay, despite being in intrinsically polluted because of certain biological functions, a woman's modesty is actually a yardstick of her purity and it is also directly related to the family honor and also the caste purity. So caste purity and women's purity are synonymous. And how does it play out? How do these ideologies play out in the society? The emphasis on arranged or negotiated marriages derives from the concern to maintain caste purity. So this is the nexus. The nexus between caste and gender ideologies are implicated in the mechanisms and the processes of women's socialization. Caste thus plays an important role in the process of growing up as a female. I quote here Leela Dubey, open quotations, women need to be controlled, their sexuality contained at all times. This is sought to be achieved through mechanisms of proper social control, idealization of familial roles, and an emphasis on female modesty. The importance of the purity of caste affects a woman in all life stages. Close quotations. Hence, patriarchy is an inherent feature of the caste order and its hierarchical structure has led what is, what is called multiple patriarchies. While Brahminical patriarchy is at the apex, there are different forms of female subjugation with specific gender norms functioning within each caste community. Noted feminist Sharmila Rege points out that as a system of graded inequalities within the caste society, there are not only multiple, but graded patriarchies structured within the grid of Brahminical patriarchy. Hence, female oppression is not unitary and women and women succumb to the gender norms of their respective caste. The sufferings of the caste Hindu or Savarna woman are different from the women from the Dalit caste. So in, in this talk, I'm going to uh, use a caste Hindu and Savarna interchangeably. Uh, similarly, I'll be using a Dalit and scheduled caste interchangeably. All right. So the sufferings of the caste Hindu or Savarna women are different from the women from the Dalit caste. While domestic violence is a predominant form of oppression among caste Hindu women, the problems of Dalit women are compounded by the hierarchical norms within the caste system. Vijay Shri, a historian, observes that though the caste Hindu women suffers private patriarchy, she enjoys considerable status within the caste society. On the other hand, Dalit women suffers private as well as public patriarchy regulated by caste norms. Apart from domestic violence, Dalit women also suffer from constant threats of sexual molestation and rape by Savarna males. She thus becomes a victim of intersectional oppression of caste and gender structures. Now, what about the resistance? How are women employed their agency in resisting the, uh, this kind of oppression? So let's look at the feminist movement. The feminist movement that emerged in the 1970s was la were largely initiated by women belonging to the caste Hindu or Savarna women. Their resistance towards patriarchal structures were confined to their personal experiences of gender oppression. The movement failed to accommodate the specific problems of Dalit women who are doubly oppressed as women and also as a Dalit because of their caste. Now, interestingly, in the 1970s, we also see the emergence of Dalit liberation movement fighting against caste impurity. I'm sorry, caste inequalities. However, the Dalit movement was male dominated, which focused on the on issues of caste discrimination and was indifferent to gender based oppression. To quote Sharmila Rege, the masculinization of the Dalit movement and the severization of womanhood led to an exclusion of the Dalit women subjected to interlocking oppression of caste, class and gender. The exclusion of Dalit women from the mainstream Dalit movement and women's movement led to the emergence of Dalit feminist movement in the 1990s. Now, while discussing the emancipatory power of the Dalit feminist movement, Shalmina Rege points out 
that it is pivoted on the individual experiences of Dalit women subjected to caste and gender oppression. While it becomes increasingly important to look into the specific problems of Dalit women, one should be careful not to blanket Dalit women as one unified category. So this is very important, the homogenization of Dalit women, which I'm going to discuss in detail now. So while it, it becomes increasingly important to look into the specific problems of Dalit women vis-a-vis -vis the caste Hindu or Savarna women, one should be careful not to blanket Dalit women as one unified category. It is vital to realize that the Dalit community is not a monolithic structure and that within it exists hierarchically stratified castes, each with a unique caste history and culture. Most importantly, despite suffering caste discrimination, this is very important. There is no, I mean, the scheduled caste is actually uh, uh, one category where there are different castes, okay? Constitutional category I'm talking of. It's, it's just not one unitary category. So most importantly, despite suffering caste discrimination, this is also important, Dalits replicate caste hierarchy within their community. So there is hierarchy within the community also, which gets missed out. Hence, the subject or agent of the Dalit women's movement is multiple and heterogeneous. And there is a need to critically examine the different forms of, of oppressions experienced by Dalit women. Now, to substantiate this, I'm going to analyze a two Dalit, Tamil Dalit literary texts, Bama Sankati and Imam's Beast of Burden, which portray the intersectional oppression of women within the Tamil Dalit community. Bama, uh, Bama Sankati, probably it's uh, in translation, in English translation, I think it's quite uh, uh, popular within the English literature departments. So I'm not very sure about Imam's Beast of Burden. Um, both Bama and Imam are uh, Tamil Dalit writers. And Sankati and Beast of Burden were originally written in Tamil and later translated into English. Now, um, as a background, um, I just want to give you certain details regarding the different cars that are there, uh, scheduled cars that are there in Tamil Nadu. So the major scheduled cars in Tamil Nadu are Parayars, Pallars, Kudiyanars, Arunthadiyars, and Vannar. So e there are some five or I I'm, like, I'm talking about the most important cars. There are so many cars uh, within the scheduled cars category in Tamil Nadu. I, I think this is the same across India, in different parts of India. Like in, in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh, you'll be having the malas and madikas. And then uh, I, I think even in Bengal, within the namashudras, you should be having different cars which, which are categorized, which are which fall within the same category. <clears throat> so the major scheduled cast in Tamil Nadu are Parayars, Pallars, Kudiyanars, Arunthadiyars, and Vannans. Though they are generally bracketed as scheduled caste are Dalits, each caste has a distinct culture. The most dominant caste in the region are the Parayars and Pallars. So there is hierarchy there. There is social positioning also over there. So the most dominant caste in the region are the Pallars and the Parayars. The Arundhatiyas occupy a lower position than the Parayars and Pallars. The Vannans are the Dobiwala, okay, the washerwomen. The Vannans are considered the lowest caste among them. The problems of Dalit women belonging to these communities are diverse and hence require specific analysis. And this paper is an attempt to locate the differences in the experiences of women within the context of the Parayar and Vannan communities who are generally bracketed as Dalits. Now, by analyzing Bama, Sankati, and Imam's Beast of Burden, this paper seeks to explore the differences in the oppression faced by women, the women within the Dalit community. Sankati and Beast of Burden were originally published in Tamil. In fact, in the same year, incidentally, in the same year, 1994, the English translations were published in 2001 and 2005, respectively. If Bama Sankati exposes the problems of Parayar women due to the exploitation of caste Hindus, Imam's Beast of Burden reveals the angst of Vannati or the washerwoman in the hands of the Parayars. So this is the kind of uh, uh, a hierarchy that is hierarchy and power play, which is, uh, which is found within the community, which does not come out at all. So analyzing these literary texts enables us to, uh, to understand the kind of power politics within the community. So if Bama Sangati exposes the problems of Parayar women due to exploitation of caste Hindus, Imam's Beast of Burden reveals the angst of the Vanati woman in the hands of the Parayars. Imam's work reveals the dissemination of power structures within the Dalit community. 
Among Tamil literary work, works written predominantly by Dalit men, Bama Sankati is an important landmark in Tamil Dalit literature. Among Tamil Dalit texts, Sankati assumed special significance because it voiced the specific problems of Dalit women. It reveals a double oppression faced by Dalit women, both as Dalit and as women, and exposes the patriarchal norms that prevail within the Dalit community. It has no plot in the normal sense of a novel, but is a series of anecdotes. <clears throat> in Tamil, Sankati means news, and the book could be considered an autobiography of a community, for it describes Dalit women of different generations. Sankati offers an in-depth discussion of the gender bias faced by Dalit women right from their childhood. In her discussion of the gender bias in Afro-American communities, because there's a lot of similarity between um, African-American women and Dalit women, so I'm just bringing in a comparison over here. In her discussion of the gender bias in Afro-American community, Elizabeth Fox Gen uh, Genovese writes, I quote, in stable societies, gender in the sense of society's prescription for how to grow up as a man or as a woman is indicated in tandem with the child's growing sense of who I am to be an I at all and to be a self is to belong to a gender. Close quotations. The fact that emphasis is placed on the inferiority of a Dalit girl right from her childhood brings to light the similarities in the double oppression experienced by Dalit and, uh, and Afro-American women. Discrimination, in fact, begins from infancy. I quote from the text. If a baby boy cries, he's instantly picked up and given milk. It is not so with girls. A boy is breastfed longer. With girls, they wean them quickly, making them forget the breast. Close quotations. When Dalit boys play games in their leisure time, Dalit girls are interested with the responsibility of, the, of doing domestic chores like, again, open quotes, cleaning vessels, drawing water, sweeping the house, gathering firewood, washing clothes, and so on and so forth. It's endless, in fact. Apart from domestic chores, Dalit girls take care of their siblings. My Kanni is one such girl who started to work from the day she learned to walk. My Kanni works when her mother delivers a baby and when her mother works, she takes care of the babies. When her siblings have grown up, she starts working in a match factory. Her life is representative of the enormous responsibilities that Dalit girls take up right from their childhood. While the labor of Dalit women becomes indispensable right from childhood, they lead a very insecure and precarious existence, both at the private and public domain. Caste Hindu men constantly threaten their existence with sexual molestation. The narrator's grandmother cautions the girls while gathering firewood. Open quotations. Women should never come on their own to these parts. If upper caste fellows clap eyes on you, you're finished. Mariamma, the narrator's cousin, is sexually molested by a caste Hindu landlord, Kumarasamy. Mariamma, however, is unable to voice her protest. She, in fact, moans. She says, he's upper caste as well. How can we even try to stand up to such people? But paradoxically, what happens is, Kumarasamy tries to save his reputation by convening the village court, which is called Panjayatu in, uh, in Tamil. I think the Panjayat, the word is also there in the other languages. So he convenes the Panjayat, the village court, and... He alleges with an allegation that Mariamma was using his field to have fun with another man. The Panjayatu is also cast by chauvinistic elderly men who turn a deaf ear to Mariamma's protest and, and, and levies a fine of rupees 200. So this is a woman who is being sexually molested by this man and he turns the tables. While in the public domain, a Dalit woman is sexually oppressed at home, she suffers the domination of her husband. A Dalit male is considered inferior to the caste Hindus, but within his community, he is regarded as superior to women. Thus, a Dalit woman is a Dalit among Dalits. A Dalit man faces oppression by the caste Hindus, but back home, he rules his family, with women becoming convenient targets of his pent-up anger and frustration. I quote, they control their women, rule over them, and find their pleasure. Within the home, they lay down the law, they were the scripture. Close quotations. Bama's Sankati is an our criticism of the patriarchal order that prevails in Dalit communities. There is a general understanding that Bama's works are representative of all Dalit women. So this is very important. 
Here it is important to emphasize that Bama Sankati is confined to the specific experiences of the Parayar community because she belongs to the Parayar community. And uh, most of her works are autobiographical, uh, starting from Karuku and then Sankati. While the Parayars are considered inferior to the caste Hindus, among Dalits, they enjoy a superior status, Dalit caste in Tamil Nadu. Defying the general idea that the Parayars are the most oppressed in the social structure of caste, Imam's a beast of burden offers a different paradigm of the Dalit community. If Sankati unearths the sufferings of Parayar women as Dalits and women, beast of burden is a shocking revelation of the subjugated lives of Vannati women or uh, uh, washer women who are subservient to the Parayars. The novel exposes the caste hierarchy prevailing within the Dalit community and the meaninglessness of the binary divisions of the oppressor and oppressed. Beast of Burden is a translation of Imeyam's Koveri Karadegal, which literally means mules. It is a poignant story of Arugyam's family who wash clothes and run errands on the villages for Dalits. So they work for the Dalits, okay? Mainly the Parayars and Pallars. I quote, we do the lowest duties to the lowest communities. That caps it all. Arugyam's family lives on the fringes of the village. Well, the Parayar colony itself is situated outside the village, away from the caste Hindus. The Vannan community lives further away from the Parayar colony. Arugyam's family has been serving the Parayars for nearly three generations and calls itself Parayar Vannati or um, Parayar Vannans or Parayar Vannati. The men are called par um, Parayar Vannans and then the women are called Parayar Vannati. They serve only the Parayars. Because there's a, I mean, there's another washerwoman for the caste Hindus, okay? They serve only the parayars for the, for there's a separate washerman serving the caste Hindus. There is strong discrimination against the Vannan community for a parayar Vannan is not allowed easy entry into the parayar household. This is, so this is, this is the, this is how caste ideologies uh, uh, play within the community. Uh, so they replicate the caste uh, uh, norms, caste hierarchy within the, um, uh, I mean, within the community. They are not paid in cash for their service. Instead, they are given the leftover food every evening and grains and clothes on, spe on special occasions and festivals. Imeyam's beast of burden encapsulates the tormenting existence of Arokim caught in the hegemonic caste structures. The pain and suffering is compounded since Arokim refuses to see herself as a victim of caste and clings on it for survival. Her sons, Joseph and, and Peter, find the system revolting. The eldest son, Joseph, leaves with his wife to Chinnasalem, a town, uh, I mean, near the place, where he opens a laundering shop, a modern version of his traditional family profession. He feels going away from the village is synonymous with moving away from the indignities and oppression suffered for centuries under the Parayars. Aragim's second son, Peter, runs away from his family not leaving any hints about his whereabouts. The novel is set in a period when the village is gradually modernizing. However, this modernity does nothing to dismantle the caste hierarchy prevalent in the village. The arrival of a new launderer and a tailor in the village threatens the very existence of the Parayar Vanati Arogyam. She is upset that not only is there less work for her, but that her usual share of leftover food and occasional special gifts is also considerably reduced. I quote, Everything they gave had diminished and dwindled. The cooked food every evening, the amount of grain doled out at the harvest time, the small chain that was distributed at rituals, everything has changed. All this makes Arugim's life very bleak and dismal. But Arugim can never take the same course as her sons. Even if her voice is suppressed by the Parayas, she has a sense of belonging only in her village. So she's, she's not employing her agency at all throughout the novel. This is something that we see. <coughs> Excuse me. Ramasamy, a parayar for whom she works, treats her badly when she demands more returns for her service. In fact, she's abused. So I quote, A donkey of a washerwoman, are you trying to tell me about justice, mongrel bitch? So this is the kind of language that is being used against her. The hurl of abuse and insults, and, and, uh, and this should be emphasized that the person who's talking is actually a parayar. Okay, who is actually being uh, discriminated within the caste society. So this is how he talks to Arokim, the Vanati woman. The hurl of abuse and insults does not bring her a sense of alienation. She consoles herself. I quote, we are a humble community. What's the use of getting angry? 
she would forget about the incident immediately it was important for her to put it right out of her mind otherwise she would have gone mad it was only by forgetting that she survived if bama sankati exposes the sexual harassment of dalit women by the caste hindu men imam's beast of burden reveals the vulnerability of the of, of the vanati women to the sexual exploitation of the parayar men arukim's daughter mary is raped by chadayan a kutukaran living in the parayar colony so she is raped by a parayar arukim and mary cannot raise their voice against this atrocity but instead are doomed to conceal it and suffer in secret i quote nobody should know what happened they must not even tell sauri i am a sinner she thought my very birth was a sin she could not be at peace any more her treasure had been looted from her the one thing she wanted to protect and cherish had been destroyed so this is mary talking now there was nothing left except darkness within close quotations arugim is exploited both at home and the parayar colony without her help her husband sauri cannot do anything so this is private and public patriarchy playing out there being what without her help her husband Sa- uh, uh, sauri cannot do anything be it washing clothes winnowing or running errands for the parayars i quote sauri might even be sitting there idly without saying a word thinking to himself that he would only begin after arogyam arrived she normally without in equal co- uh, partnership with her, with him without her help sauri could scarcely complete the winnowing of a single granary a day so once he returns home sauri demands food never bothering about arogyam's hunger when sauri returned home after delivering clothes from house to house and collecting the evening meal he expected his plate full of rice otherwise he immediately starts shouting in anger he could never endure an empty stomach even for a moment close quotations throughout the novel arokim is seen as a mother figure constantly struggling to bring happiness to her family but to her dismay she has neither peace nor happiness her daughter leaves her after marriage her son's desert her earlier the indifference and neglect to the parayars towards her suffering disillusion her i quote it struck her that she that she who looked after all the village women and their children serving them in their good times and bad times washing their shit and urine away could do nothing for her children apart from being a vanati a dobi woman she had helped the colony women in child delivery colony here of course is referring to the parayar colony she had helped the colony women in child delivery and related illness illnesses but her love and sincerity go unrequited she finds that her sons and the parayars will not help her in her old age i quote it how am i to survive by trusting these people any more it looks as if they want so much as care to give me a little gruel in my last days when this piece of wood my body is ready for the cremation ground close quotes in the end there is no significant change in arogyam's life her daughter mary returns home after losing her husband adding to arogyam's grief the drudgery of being a vanati continues i quote it's all emptiness that's the end of the story the analysis of sankati and beast of burden is not confined to a comparative study of bama and imam's protagonist protagonist there are many similarities no doubt <coughs> both are dalits women and above all oppressed due to caste and gender <coughs> excuse me through the analysis of the two dalit texts i want to reiterate that a study of dalit women would fall short of completeness if we fail to realize that dalit women come from diverse backgrounds and hence their problems are not homogenous it is irrelevant to consider dalit women as a single and unified category and there is an increasing need for local specific and historically informed analysis carefully grounded in both spatial and cultural context texts like bama sankati and mam's beast of burden helps to create an awareness of the internal differences within the dalit community an effective method to address the problems of dalit women is to take this differences in their experiences seriously yeah thank you thanks a lot for yeah. this wonderful presentation and um, before going to take a few questions um, yeah. i just want to share, uh, i just want to share my observation that uh, i think that at a time when the communities around the world are experiencing several health and economic issues due to this covid 19 pandemic i think that acts of violence on the basis of color and caste are incredibly 
uh, shameful for humanity for us and um, uh, we should need to build a stronger solidarity between black and dalit and the right movement and um, we can see that uh, this kind of black lives matter dalit lives matter are yeah. they are channel the discourse around the institutionalized racism and casteism that exist and challenge the biases uh, at work and at the same time i think that with this pandemic I, i'm going to uh, relate it with pandemic uh, when yeah. the virus is infecting uh, anyone irrespective of religion caste or creed it is uh, really discomforting to see the misuse of power by those in positions of authority those are blatantly violating people's bodies in accordance because of their biases and prejudices so i think yeah. that uh, it's a caste based was job the news. And one young girl was uh, sexually molested i think it was very much there in the news uh, within the covid hospital itself but i think i remember seeing it yesterday or day before yeah So, um, so my observation is that do you think that covid 19 is um, this this pandemic is is a thoroughly caste pandemic how how caste is this pandemic this covid 19 the virus does not look out, i mean irrespective of whichever caste or region or nationality or gender that you belong to virus is a leveler but then the way it plays out uh, within the social structure is something that uh, we need to analyze uh, i mean look at the caste uh, differences uh, uh, class differences first let's just start from the class differences because uh, the migrants issue of course is uh, is uh, is uh, i mean would speak volumes about the kind of class differences that, that are there uh, but then if you want to look at uh, from gender and uh, caste uh, um, angle i think there is so much that we need to look at um, i mean for instance the i mean there is a uh, um, Uh, there is a locality which is very close to my campus uh, and then uh, we have uh, we, we we have our domestic help and then other services uh, that we get from that particular uh, locality and most of them are also women but then um, when this uh, the pandemic came up and then we had to close the campus doors and then um, they just lost their jobs so very few conscientious uh, families or uh, or people actually pay their house help and then um, and, and and also while uh, i mean while trying to reach out to the i mean to the families in these localities i because i was involved in that kind of work a group of uh, faculty and some um, uh, and, and some students we just came together we have uh, an ngo functioning within our campus uh, uh, nirman so we just came together and we thought uh, uh, and we just did whatever we could i mean whatever little bit we could Uh, we, we were trying to help out uh, uh, the locality, and so, and this is something that I came up. And there is a Lamani a colony within that locality, and then I also heard this was an NGO. This is something that I heard from, uh, um, uh, like I wouldn't blame the NGO. I wouldn't even name, but I wouldn't blame the NGO. But there was a person who was working for the NGO who told me that, I mean, why should we give the Lamanis? And then I asked her why, and then she said, uh, no, they get from Karnataka everything. They're basically from Karnataka. Then I thought probably it could also be the caste angle over there because Lamani is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they belong to the um, uh, uh, lower rungs of the caste order. It could be that also. So this this needs a, a specific analysis. So that is very very important. We just need to look into the issues very very closely. Um, uh, I mean, not only from uh, I mean from the class perspective, but also from a gender and um, and caste perspective, as you pointed okay. out. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to take a few questions. Uh, first yeah. of all, um, there is a question that um, in in case is Shabari uh, Pala Temple, it is often projected as a conflict between conservation of culture or rituals by followers versus the enforcement of morality of gender equality by outsiders who do not follow faith of shabari mala how do you negotiate with such a conflict shabari mala is actually premised on uh, the notions of purity and pollution that uh, we were discussing because uh, uh, women are uh, i mean we are slotted as impure we are intrinsically impure because of the menstrual cycle that we go through and then that particular uh, god is supposed to be um, uh, i mean his sanctity would be violated if we enter the temple so um, this is this is actually premised on religious ideologies and then irrespective of whichever caste you uh, belong to uh, so so that is why uh, i mean there is a uh, graded patriarchy so i mean probably it starts with brahmanical patriarchy i, I also mentioned that brahmanical patriarchy is at the pay, uh, is is at the apex so 
Shabrimala issue is a perfect example of Brahminical patriarchy. Whereas what we discussed from the text, I mean, drawing from the text is actually Dalit patriarchy playing out. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There is another. I hope I answered the um, question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, seen through the lens of Dalit feminist discourses in which internal and external patriarchy operate in their life uh, insensibly. How will you address the framework of transgender Dalit women and their di different standpoints? There is another section. This is the first part, and I'm also telling you the second part. And while negotiating the power play, don't you think a lot of Dalit literature on the life of Dalit transgender women should also be undertaken? Yes, yes, very, very. Uh, I mean, this is very, very important. That is why uh, I mean, this actually, this uh, this paper actually points to that. There is no point in homogenizing categories. You know, when we are discussing, of course, there. Is, I mean, there is a. Uh, I mean, there is a necessity to look into the specific problems of Dalit women. But within Dalit women, there are different categories, and transgender women is also one such category. We need to look into that specifically. We cannot take this. I mean, uh, these criteria. This is a yardstick to analyze that. We cannot do that. Yeah. The specific okay. experiences it is it is more experiential so i think we just need to uh, uh, look into each case or each each category very specifically and see into the internal differences because even within transgenders i mean let's just take even dalit women i mean uh, uh, the caste differences are there but also uh, class differences are there uh, urban rural that difference is also there so even among transgenders that is also coming up slowly now yeah um. How does patriarchal oppression work in the casteless indigenous communities? Um, Caste-based indigenous communities. This is actually this 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 needs a, a, a lot of analysis because um, I have a research scholar who I mean he finished his PhD. He he worked on an indigenous community in the Nilgiris, and then he came and told me that there is gender equality. At the, I mean this is this is something that is there at the surface level, but then you just go and analyze, and you will find that there are. I mean there is gender discrimination over there also, but by and large, uh, there is a kind of a gender equality which. Which is being followed over there. That is what um, uh, this is again from the from one particular Irula community that he uh, that he worked on. Um, so it, it might vary from community to community. Indigenous community again, um, uh, that literature is also coming up. And then um, uh, I mean there are uh, a lot of theories which are uh, which are focusing on indigenous lives. And then we need to look at uh, the, the I mean the kind of uh, experiences that indigenous women are. Uh, are are going through or or whether they are employing their agency or whether they are resisting is there i mean are they suffering oppression is the first question that we need to ask because we cannot equate yeah. dalit women with indigenous women because they are two different uh, communities and okay. then within the community we just need to uh, raise further questions uh, if 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 of course they, if they if 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 there's a general understanding that there is gender equality within the indigenous communities is it being followed discreetly okay and then we need to do a, a analysis of it. Yeah, okay. I think more well, and more research is being focused on these things now. Yeah, on on the indigenous communities, it is slowly coming up because yes. uh, um, when I mean uh, for uh, Professor Swati Agarwal, there was a question that why is it that Dalit literature is not being worked upon? That has already started. Indigenous literature is also being taken up now. Yeah. Yes. Um, what are the possible active or passive agencies that the Dalit women could use as a resistance to oppose the patriarchal structures? Active uh, active resistance is of course um, is is what Bama and then um, uh, Meena Kandasami and then Shivakami and so many others Kumut Pavde all of them are doing. That is activism. Okay, so either it's through the through a lit I mean through literature or uh, politically. But then passive uh, resistance uh, also happens because uh, I, I don't know uh, how many have read the Sangati. Within Sangati, towards the end, she's talking of the kind of discussions that are happening uh, uh, within the uh, I mean within the community, and then and then there and actually you know she talks about how uh, how determined the, the, the uh, and um, how determined that uh, uh, the uh, Dalit women are and how they can fight against all odds and still and and still I mean they have this indomitable courage. 
that's there in them, that grit and determination to fight against all odds. And in fact, towards the end of Sankati, it is actually the voices of different women um, uh, within the community. They're actually, she's actually trying to draw a comparison between the kind of lives that the upper caste women or the caste Hindu women or the Savarna women are leading and the kind of lives that they are leading. And, and the discussion goes on like this, that uh, I mean, probably we are privileged because those women are confined to the households and they probably uh, 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 suffer patriarchy, but they're within the house. At least we have this freedom to come out and work and we can see money in hands. And of course, half the time they're exploited by the men in the house. But still, there is a kind of a discussion. So passive resistance is something that is brewing up. Probably it is within the, I think passive resistance is there, um, is, is there within any community as far as women are concerned. We do resist in so many discrete ways, but how many of us come out and then um, uh, uh, um, politically intervene or I, I mean the kind of political intervention or uh, become activists, uh, uh, social activists um, is, is something that is, uh, that is questionable. Yeah. This discussion, this, this, I mean, this platform is actually a kind of a passive. It's it's actually uh, re revealing the kind of passive resistance. At least we are discussing. It happens in the academia yes. throughout. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> These are bit, uh, uh, one of the most interesting questions that I'm um, coming across, and and also seems this uh, FDP on gender sensitization and gender doesn't mean only that uh, uh, specific class like women. It can it also includes male. So the question yeah, it is includes that, male. It's transgender. Yes, yes. It's, I, I, yes. Should, I should. Transgender have gender also. Gender. Yes, it includes yeah. transgender yeah. also. So the question is that, you know, don't you think that Dalit men are equally exploited by upper class women? But why did they never raise their voice against women? What will be your take on <laughs> Dalit men are exploited not only by upper caste uh, women, but also by men. Okay, by because, men. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's both. So we are just going to put them uh, uh, in, in one category. Okay, we are just not going to look at the kind, because there isn't much of a difference between uh, uh, between the kind of uh, exploitation that the that the Dalit man suffers in the hands of an upper caste woman and the upper caste man. It's, uh, it's almost the yeah. same. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. thanks a lot, and um, it seems really true that uh, uh, we are living in a society, and uh, it's the caste-based jobs such as uh, uh, sanitation, drain cleaning, that subsequent minimum, minimum uh, social values, inadequate remunerations, leading to unhygienic slum-based lifestyles, which makes Dalit and Adivasi communities tormented, not just by their caste identities, but by the repercussions also and the fatal risk of COVID-19 is, is also there and this kind of talk that just Professor Gita has delivered, um, we should ponder upon that what we need to do uh, to change the whole scenario. So in this context, I would like to personally thank you for your for wonderful presentation. Judging from the comments of those who attended, it seems that this session was truly successful and we hope that you will uh, want to be involved in our um, further academic ventures and we are pleased to have your participation in this lecture series and we thank you for course, your val valuable thank valuable contribution. I'd like to thank you again Dr. Um, Karmakar for having me over here and I just really enjoyed. I hope the participants also liked. Yes, uh, yes, they have also liked and the comments are like that. <laughs> this, is, this is a new experience for me. And then when we don't have a personal presentation, we just don't even know whether uh, participants are yawning or <laughs> I don't know. I hope uh, it, uh, they were engaged. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So and now we are moving towards the last session of our day one. And we are thoroughly enjoying all the presentations. Now let me welcome you, Professor Asha Shen who is a professor of post-colonial literature and theory at the University of Wisconsin, Euclid, US. She is also served as the director of the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program at the University of Wisconsin, Euclid from 2013 to 2016. She is the author of the book, Post-Colonial Yearning, Reshaping Spiritual and Secular Discourses in Contemporary 
literature published from Palgrave Macmillan in 2013 and has published articles in scholarly journals such as a review of international literature in English that is ADL, Journal of Commonwealth and Post-Colonial Studies, South Asian Review and these are all wonderful journals and we are all looking forward to this kind of writing as well. She has recently contributed a solicited article on post-colonial travel writing and spirituality to the Cambridge Companion to post-colonial travel writing that is edited by Robert Clark and that's published by Cambridge in 2018. So I am welcoming you and the stage is all yours. Thank you yes. so much, Gautam. Can you oh. hear me? Is everything okay? okay. I, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much for this invitation. I was able to listen to Professor Agarwal and Professor Gita. Um, it, it is both presentations were so exciting. And your own comments, Gautam, about the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, we're in a moment where how, I really want to think about how we can be transnational allies to each other, build some kind of solidarity against structures of power and privilege. And I was very, it was very interesting listening to uh, uh, Professor Agarwal talk about um, desire and uh, Dr. Gita talk about um, uh, gender and caste. So just, I, I, I've been teaching for about 20 odd years now. Um, in a public university in the upper Midwest. And it's a pretty my homogenous white student body that I teach to. It's becoming a little bit more diverse. A lot of my students are first generation students and most of them are cisgender um, and they identify as female. I also have a few men, um, some a few LGBTQ and transgender students, uh, but that gives you a little bit of um, background and so, these students sometimes will come in um, with some background to US women's studies, or today we would call it women, gender, and sexuality studies, but not with not, not much exposure to anything else. And so primarily in terms of the exposure to feminism, it has been white feminism, and it's been on a sort of wave model. And in the US, it was the first wave was in late 19th, 20th century focusing on women's voting rights. The second wave was in the 60s and 70s, more about equal rights. And um, more recently, you have the third wave, which has been talking more about intersectionality and race and gender, nationality, sexuality, how they all intersect. And of course, today we've got the Me Too movement, which has become a global movement, and social media are playing very increasingly important roles. Um, because the subject of um, feminism in the US, as, or feminism as my students know, it has been traditionally white. Um, some of my students will adopt what we call in the US a bit of a white savior attitude towards women of color or women in the global south. Like they think we've got to rescue them, they have it so bad, they, we have to make them like us. And they move the gaze away from themselves and they don't understand how their own lives are oppressed and that they can also be um, a complicit in the oppression of others. Um, so within the U.S. in 1981, there was this really important book called this Bridge Call My Back, Writings oh. by Radical Women of Color, where women of color activists came together and tried to make this sort of intervention and broaden in, um, the space and interrogate the space of whiteness. And this book is currently in its fourth edition, so it talks about how important it is. Um, in recent years, we've been adopting a more transnational approach, and we um, acknowledge women's you know, we try to look at how women in the U.S. can be complicit with government policy that discriminates against poorer communities, women of color communities, women in the global south. Um, so, what, what, you know, the timeliness of your presentation of your conference, and um, you know, is the problem with the waves model that students are familiar with is they think, oh, it happened way in the past, and what's looking. Uh, and, and today, women of color still make much less than white women. And what George Floyd, um, the murder that of the African-American man in Minneapolis by the police, uh, the very visible murder of George Floyd, the COVID-19 pandemic in the US across the world, it's really exposed, like Gotham was saying, structural racism, systemic disenfranchisement, and we really need to talk. I mean, now it's forcing us to talk about structural inequality, even if we were reluctant to do it earlier. 
So in the paper that follows, um, I, I'm presenting my efforts to foster this kind of an approach in WGSS or Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and specifically in a study abroad program that we developed in our university, the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, with Miranda House College in New Delhi to talk about women's activism in India. Um, so in every historical period, I tell my students, every part of the world, the concept of woman is habitually being deployed to further the interests of specific groups which often have radically anti-feminist agendas. For instance, if we were to look at colonial discourse, you have the idea, again, the rescue narrative, the body of the woman who has to be saved. Um, in India, the reference to widow burning and osapi became the ways in which the British said that you're not ready for independence. We need to be here to take care of these women because you're not too barbaric. Or where you have the upper caste Hindu woman, her body being exploited by nationalists to again create a very fairly patriarchal view of India that in opposition to British imperialism. And so where are we're always trying to do archival work or you know talk about agency? How do we find agency within these systems? You know, when we had the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, those invasions, um, again, the idea was in the US, uh, feminists would say, we have to save those poor women from the Taliban. That's why we need to do this. And if you look to the newspapers and social media and everything, when um, the, uh, the Kabul fell, people would say, oh, they've got beauty parlors now. This is so great. Um, so again, we need to really unsettle this night notion of, um, you know, a unified category of womanhood, which is often in the US based on upper class white womanhood. And um, that's the sort of work the transnational scholars and women of color activists are doing. But even in this bridge call my back, which I referenced, the focus, at least when it first came out, was very much within the US. It wasn't really looking at policy outside of the US. And it needs to be, was to that extent, it was almost assuming it a global perspective, but not really looking at structures of power um, in terms of foreign foreign policy, in terms of um, uh, the US's relationship with other countries. And um, with the rapid acceleration of globalization in a post 9-11 world, we've moved into this world in the US and academia for this need for high impact uh, emergence, which in itself is a little problematic, but it's the idea of two or three weeks in another country learn all about that country and um, you know a lot of it is capitalist business driven also um, so I oh, how are these I guess part of what I'm thinking about is are these practices um, redeem redeemable can they be made useful in a way that we would like to in terms of talking about structures of power and privilege and one of the things to keep in mind is the idea that the nation state in and of itself was also often taken as a nomen that's taken as a normative category, but it was actually in itself a construction by Europe. And, um, you know, Europeans determined whether their colonial subjects, their colonized subjects were ready for uh, nationhood. Um, and just to look a little bit of histor historical background to these study abroad broad programs, um, academic interest in internationalization can be traced back to the 1950s with the start of CIA-funded area studies programs, which was basically designed to get a better understanding of the nation's Cold War enemies. But um, as Leela Fernandez points out, what's distinctive about the current emphasis on a global perspective is the attempt of new programs and avenues of intellectual inquiry to move beyond the borders of the nation states. Um, and it's very important, like another Muslim critic Ila Shohat has said that we really need to warn against, and this is a quote from Shohat, paradigms that are generated from a US perspective and then extended into others whose lives and practices become absorbed into a homogenizing, overarching feminist master narrative. This kind of just adding on, you get different groups of women from different regions, different ethnicities, and it seems like they're all separate and distinct, and um, it, it, and this is obviously a problem because nothing is changing. And she uses an example, Lila Fernandez, of Ms. Magazine, which is when 
uh, women in Saudi Arabia were finally given the right to drive. That got a lot of press and um, among women's groups. And uh, Miss Magazine said, had this title that said, Saudi women drive. And Lila Fernandez's point is that the use of an internationally oriented marker for a generic, teach, a generic teaching oriented ad seems to imply widespread public interest and a presumed marketability of a sign of the global fight for women's rights. But as she points out, this presumption is rooted in a mainstream national cultural symbol in the US driving that circulates widely in public discourses and popular culture. And so the idea of the international is still being very firmly um, cast through a very national framing of the feminist imagination. The idea of the Saudi woman driving is very much a part of the US national imagination. So the geographic imagination is still located in the US, even as it's looking at across US borders. So one way that Fernandez suggests that we move away from this is to really um, draw, she draws upon the theoretical work of Joel Migdal and Timothy Mitchell, who, who, and they question the assumption that there are predetermined or self-evident boundaries between state and civil society. The heart of state power in such a conception lies in the ways in which it is able to draw a series of social, political, territorial boundaries. So there's a clear demarcation between the state and civil society. And this is a problematic, it's an invented creation and one needs to, I wanna unpack it. And I think by unpacking this division, we can actually think beyond um, some of the problems of an additive uh, approach. Um, and I actually want to spend a little bit of time talking about the George Floyd murder. And when that happened, um, a lot of us in the U.S. were said, said, how could someone be killed for a 20, counterfeit $20 bill? You know, um, why would the police even call? Um, and critic here, Mustafa Bayoumi, talks about how in the context of we have something called nuisance abatement laws. Um, and these laws force immigrant stores in low income neighborhoods to operate as the long arm of law enforcement. These stores can actually be shut down by municipalities if any undesirable activity, whether it's legal or illegal, takes place in them, even if the store owner is not aware of what is going on. And when they then, the stores petition to open, they are often forced to accept warrantless searches of their premises or electronic surveillance of their customers for the police. And this is what happened in the cup food stores in Minneapolis, store in Minneapolis where George Floyd was murdered outside the store where they called the, the police on him. Um, the store owner, interestingly enough, who is Muslim and Arab was, um, was not in the store when this happened. And the store got a huge backlash. And he has since come out and said how terrible this is and how devastated he is. And, the Black Lives Matter has been, you know, he, a lot has been gaining a great deal of momentum in the U.S. today. Um, but it does; these policies also allow uh, South Asian, Arab immigrant um, immigrants who are often quite racist towards the black communities that they serve to 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 also abuse them. So I, I think again, it's important to think about these nuisance abatement laws makes us understand that there isn't state and civil society aren't that separate. Um, this becomes very important also for women, gender and sexuality studies in the US today, because a university like mine, which is part of the University of Wisconsin system, it's a state funded university, but over the years, states have been withdrawing their support for programs like ours and for the university at, at, at for, for the whole university, but especially for programs like WGS, which have always been kind of precariously located. And now more and more when there's this less and less funding, when COVID-19 has struck and people are, universities are more worried about revenue, programs that deal with these talking about structures of power and privilege and structural inequity, um, you know, are under uh, in, uh, danger of being cut. 
And again, I think it's important for us to remember that these universities are not separate from the state. They actually, um, University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, its origins lie in the in the state, and it um, the Wisconsin idea where I'm located originated with the UW president John Bascom and Wisconsin-born progressive movement of Senator Robert La La Follette. And embedded in its vision is the idea, and this is in quotes, that the role of our great state university should be above all to seek the truth and apply the knowledge gained therein for the benefit of student state and society as a whole. So the social justice mission of WGS programs, which seek to educate students and the Wisconsin public about ways of creating an equi uh, equitable society. And to that extent, we work with community NGOs um, like, like Planned Parenthood, which deals with reproductive rights and provides them. And also not just reproductive rights, but basic health needs that, you know, that, are, given to, uh, that are given to people who cannot afford insurance. Um, and similarly, if we were to look at the history of Delhi University, uh, we see a similar, and we worked with, we collaborated with Miranda House College, which was part of Delhi University. And it was formally established, Delhi University, in 1922, so the, although some of the colleges predate that. And it has a women's studies cell, which is made up of different participating colleges, like just as Wisconsin has a UW Women's a system, women and gender studies consortium, and we so we ran this program between our universities, and we took twelve students in twenty fourteen to work with Miranda House students and to actually do two two weeks of lectures and one week of field work um, with several non government organizations like the Center for Advocacy of Research and Women Power Connect, and um, they presented uh, based on what they, uh, they did presentations with their Miranda House peers. Um, and I think learning about witnessing, participating in women's rights activism in India enabled students to get a sense of civic and social responsibility. Um, and a, a sort of to, to, they were able to take this home, bring it back home to us and then go back. And there was a sort of transnational solidarity building and um, based on my experience, I kind of also learned on the ground with them. Um, and based on the learning experience, I've come up with some issues that we then repeat and we think about as we frame our learning, uh, but even before we go. And the first question that really came up was just the whole ability to travel. You know, who gets to travel, under what terms and conditions? An American passport allows you to go to most, or used to, I mean, not perhaps at this historical moment of time, but used to allow you to go to most of the world as opposed to an Indian passport. And so when students actually had to do the visa work to get a visa to go to India, that was a, quite troubling for them. They had to really question the fact that they couldn't just go there. Um, and in a way, you know, uh, it was very much like what Edward Said said uh, when he was talking about um, colonialism, he said, you know, France was superior technology allowed France to do to Egypt, what Egypt couldn't do to France. Um, you know, colonization fueled the industrial revolution in, in, in Europe, but left post-colonial economies quite depleted. Um, so, and then you have this, the whole idea of job scarcity and civil war and the flood of immigration to Europe um, in the post-World War II years. And so in a way by going, they had to step back and use what their lived experience, what they were dealing with to understand the history of immigration to the US, which at the moment has become very fraught. Also, again, it's timely because if you think of what's happened with green card applications being suspended here, H-1B applications being suspended, international students on F-1 visas were being told they had to leave the country. And now uh, they, if they could, because every, a lot of universities are going online, and so in the middle of the pandemic, they were being asked to leave or told to leave. Now, um, if they've left, that's been changed. But if they've left, they can't come back in. Um, so again, it feels very timely, uh, a lot of what we're talking about. Um, the case of, um, and then I tell them often, 
about South Asian immigrant, and that's the case of Bhagat Sin Pind. And we use this to talk about how immigration and race are connected and how race is also a constructed category that is often used to benefit those in power. So in 1790 in the US, the first Congress decided that to become a naturalized citizen, a person must be white. But when Indians applied for citizenship in 1906, people didn't know whether they were white or not. So essentially, the chief bureau asked all US attorneys to oppose the, the naturalization of Hindus or East Indians. And yet, Calcutta born Afghani Abdullah Dola was naturalized because a judge looked at him and said, Yes, you're white. And between 1908 and 1922, 69 Indians actually were allowed to become citizens because they were seen as white. But in 23, 1923, when Bhagat Singh Pind applied for citizenship under this category of white, the US Supreme Court then reversed precedent and argued that white could not be synonymous with Caucasian and had to be used in terms of common man usage. So between 1923 and 1926, from 60 to 70 South, Indian, uh, South Asians have their naturalization certificates rescinded. And it was only under uh, 1965, under the passage of the Immigration Act then, that they were allowed to come in. And this is, um, I'm quoting Kamala Viswesaran, who's done a lot of scholarship in this old um, area. Um, and as she continues, that it was interesting uh, that initially immigrants, South Asian immigrants, would actually say that, yeah, they'd use race, they'd say we are white. They wouldn't challenge the idea of being exclusion. They would want to be considered white so that they could become immigrants. But more recently, um, you know, because of affirmative action rights, they have tended to identify as um, as of being a quote unquote color and um, as minorities. And so again, thinking as you're traveling abroad and you're going through processes, just thinking about the legal discourses about immigrants as illegal aliens who apply for advanced parole, um, you know, in order that they might visit, you know, families back home and thinking about the whole criminalization of the immigrant process. Um, and I share with students a piece of writing that I've done based on my own immigrant experience as a professional immigrant who came here as a student and was then offered a job at my university who sponsored my green card. So this is kind of fictional and thank you, you know, I writing for this for me is as an English professor too, as a form of therapy. So thank you for bearing with me as I read this out to you. Um, it's so, like I say, it's partly fabricated, but it's an attempt to create a situation of understanding and empathy for what an immigrant goes through. And especially in a pandemic today where American families are not being able to visit their own family members, I hope that this would foster a greater understanding of the immigrant experience. So it's called Dearest Ma, Letters from an Immigrant Daughter to Her Mother Back Home. Dearest Ma, your letter arrived today, but I was late for class, so I grabbed it and ran to Dr. Green's Modern British Literature class. I read it right under his nose. I couldn't wait, but he was kind. He took off his glasses and rubbed his eyes and asked me how long a letter from India takes. When I told him 10 to 15 days, he looked away and softly said, oh, that's too long, too long. Dearest Ma, all three of your letters came today. When I told my friends my mother writes to me three times a week, they don't believe me, but I think they're secretly jealous. So much to talk about, I will call you tomorrow. Dearest Ma, when I called you last night, I forgot to tell you there was a mother and daughter from Germany in the arrival line in front of me in Chicago. I almost cried when I saw them. They reminded me so much of you and me. They were very nice to me, but they could speak no English at all. Ma, it must be so hard for them, but at least they have each other. Dearest Ma, I know, I know. You never wanted me to come to this country, I insisted, but maybe you were right. But the professors are great and the students are nice and I love my work. Still, I'm saving all my pay to buy a round trip ticket home in the summer so I can be with all of you again. The only thing I'm not looking forward to is going to Chennai and having to wait in that queue from 2 a.m. in the morning just for that interview to get my visa renewed. And I have to do this year after year after year. Dear Isma, each time I fly away, I say goodbye to the two people I love most in the whole world. I waved and waved and waved at you and Baba. 
till you both turned into little dots on the horizon. You keep saying how proud you are of me, but I sometimes wonder, is having a career worth all the pain it brings us? Dearest mom, my prelims are looming and I'm so scared. Everyone here says this is what makes or breaks you. If you fail, you only get one second chance at passing. I wish you were here with me, like when you flew to Calcutta for my BA finals. Dearest Ma, I passed. I'm ABD, all but dissertation. Aren't you proud of me now? I'm coming home this year to celebrate with you and the family. The only thing is, as a foreign student, I can't do any work outside of my teaching assistantship. But I found work in the summer, shelving books in the library and cleaning dishes in the cafeteria. Cafeteria. No, you must not send the $100 you and Baba saved. Even if the government allows it, you may need it sometime. We will all go out and celebrate when I'm home. Dearest Ma, being ABD is nice, but I still have to form a committee and write a 300 word thesis. I want to write on Indian writers. What do you think of Amitav Kosh? Dearest Ma, I got it done. I finished the thesis and passed the interview and got the job. They even said they would sponsor my green card, that I could sponsor you and Baba. Oh, I know you will never leave your boys, even for me, but I did it all on my own. Aren't you proud of me now? Dearest Ma, no, I didn't go to graduation. It cost too much. And besides, it's only fun if you have family here. And I know you and Baba can't afford to come anyway, and my health is such a worry. You can't leave them alone. Dearest Ma, the green card process takes so long. They have to prove that you aren't taking away a job from a U.S. citizen or a green card holder. And there were more than 300 candidates for my job, and some must have been really good. No wonder no one wants to employ us. No wonder all my friends went in for green card marriages. Trust me to do it the hard way. Dearest Ma, it's been two years since I saw you last. My students are nice, my colleagues are nice, but I still can't leave the country. Dinesh says he'll marry me if that will speed up the process, but since we already started the other way, this will only muddy the water and make things worse. Besides, I love him so much, I don't want to ever accuse him to ever accuse me of marrying him for my green card. Dearest Ma, it's been three years now and still no green card. I worry so much about your dizzy spells. Baba says you almost fell down one time. Every time the phone rings at night, I worry that something has gone wrong with you or Baba. Did I tell you when Rajesh's father died, he couldn't go back for the funeral? Dearest Ma, my lawyer says I can come home for 30 days. I have to apply for something called advance parole. Can you believe it? I feel like such a criminal. I even had to go back to Chicago for the HIV tests. The immigration sent testing center was so seedy. I didn't want to let you and Baba know because I remember how upset you were when Mala's aunt wanted to take me for a pap smear. But I've already applied for my advance parole and then I can be with you for 30 whole days. And we can celebrate and celebrate and celebrate. Dearest Ma, I should never have come to see you. I should have never dragged you out that night. You were so tired. You only went for me. And then you tripped and fell and hit your head so badly. Even as I write this letter, you were still in a coma. My lawyer told me that if I didn't come back to the US within the 30 day limit, they wouldn't let me back in. So I left you and came. Did I do right? Are you proud of me now? Dearest Ma, you came out of the coma. Baba said you kept asking and asking for me and I wasn't with you. I thank God every day you are still alive. My lawyer says it's legal for me to come back after a month to see you again, but I can't stay for longer than 30 days. Dearest Ma, mm -hmm. can you believe the green card still isn't here? How long has it been now? Four or five years, I've lost count. Why did you cry when I got married? I know it was a short visit, but Nilesh is a nice boy. You even said so yourself, and his parents are from India. You said I will never come back now that I've married an American, but I'll take a leave of absence from my job and stay with you just as soon as my green card comes. Dearest Ma, I can't send this letter to you. The green card came, but not before your dementia set in. They say it was brought on by the TBI from your fall. Now you can no longer read or write to me, but my green card lets me come and stay with you whenever my job permits. And we sing together and tell stories. And then you rest your head on my chest and whisper, take me to bed, baby, I'm tired, take me to bed. Dearest Ma, you died today and I wasn't by your side. I was teaching a class of students when I got the news. It was hard to leave you that winter. 
watching Baba feed you with a dropper. I promised I'd be back in the summer, but you left us all in Easter. Dearest Ma, it's six years since you passed away. Baba died the year after you. The pain of losing you killed him too. Sometimes I wish I could have followed suit. Aisha turned five today. She has Nalesha's big brown eyes and curly lashes. People say she looks like me, but I think she looks like you. Dearest Ma, this is not the America I came to. When people asked where I was from, I would say India, but I had to give up Indian citizenship to become an American passport holder. But people don't believe me when I say America. They say, no, where are you really from? The last time we came back from India, they interrogated Nilesh for the longest time, even though he's born and brought up here. After 9-11, the mood was so ugly. I used to fear for our safety, and now it's 10 times worse. Today, Aisha came home in tears. She wouldn't say what was wrong, but Pankaj's mother called me to say some kids spat at them and told them to go back where they came from. What do I tell her, Ma? I became an American, but she was born and brought up here. Now people are scared. They, are, they will stop the passports of some U.S. immigrant citizens. If this happens to us, where will we go? We are not Indians anymore. Dearest Ma, was this your fear? when you let your only girl child go? You always said people are nice, but in the end, they will always stick to their own kind. Would it have been better if I had stayed behind and never left so long ago? Dearest Ma, we will never not know, but dearest Ma, I miss you so. So this piece um, resonates, like I said, um, I have friends at the moment who parents are seriously ill who cannot return to India. When you're on an immigrant visa, as you know, you cannot return to India. In the moment of the pandemic, we have people who are, whose parents, whose loved ones are dying and who are not able to be with them. Um, so again, the timeliness of what we're talking about is really, I think there's a huge need for this. And hopefully undergoing a pandemic will make people more sympathetic to the situation of immigrants. Um, I want to conclude by talking about our experiences, a few of our experiences in India, where it was interesting. Uh, among American students, the Hmong are from Laos, and they've come here primarily as refugees, tended to pass more easily in India because they looked um, like um, someone from Assam or Mizoram or, or Tibetan. And to that extent, they actually had more privilege than, than some of our white students. So, felt that they were who had white privilege, but it was sort of commodified because groups of Indians. And I think in terms of our own as Indians, internalized racism, you know, which is exemplified in Bollywood and skin lightening, uh, you know, schemes and ads and marriage advertisements. Um, a lot of our, they wanted to pose with our, Indians wanted to pose with our white students. And, um, and that was difficult also for our students who got more hassled. And but it was, there was this conversation between one of our Hmong American students and one of our Miranda House students, which struck me as especially poignant because uh, the Miranda House student who's light complexion had no idea that she would, couldn't understand why she would not be seen as white and how she would become a woman of color in the US because she, her complexion was so privileged in India. And so that becomes an issue for those of us who cross borders where we belong to part of the majority culture in our home countries, but we come here and we become women of color. Um, and what our students ultimately learned was that it's not enough to have a checkoff list of do's and don'ts. This is what Miranda House had given them. You should do this. You should not do that. You should always bargain. Don't be taken for a ride. But, um, you know, but then they realized what the exchange rate was like. And they realized even though they didn't have much money, the dollar went so much further. They also had to deal with the fact that a lot of the labor they were seeing were migrant workers, men who'd left their villages, left their families to serve the needs of our students, among others. And um, interestingly enough, you know, Miranda House, as you know, is one of a, a, a really premier university and the competition to get in and to succeed is really high. So our students who came kind of from the rural Midwest were kind of shocked at how their students would talk of each other, be very argumentative. And they, it was interesting to see no, you know, students who went there saying we need to rescue them actually became, they were much, our American students were much more 
adhere to sort of conservative domestic ideas of femininity, especially when they, and they were kind of appalled by how assertive the Indian students were. Um, when we actually went to these different field locations, some of them was, we went to the Crisis Management Center in Nizamuddin, which provides legal and counseling services to victims of domestic violence. Then we went to the Mahila Panchayat, which was a woman's shelter, which handled cases of violence against women. The Harsh Bihar uh, Police Help Desk and the De Delhi Secretariat Woman Helpline. And so they were actually able to see activism in motion and understanding you know, when to speak, when to be silent, when to listen, who's being represented, how, um, and the sense of geography and space was also complicated because even though we lived in, next to Kamla Nagar in North Delhi, they felt pretty safe there, but when they moved into the more touristy areas, the more affluent areas of South Delhi, they were subjected to more scrutiny and um, aggression in some ways. So again, there was a questioning of geography and space, and so a lot of you know, the pedagogical classroom experience was accentuated, challenged, redefined by and transformed by the actual experience of being there. And when we come back, when they came back, they were being told, um, how do you help you now use this working with NGOs within uh, this area? And um, also, how do we have these conversations with students who are now um, going back and faculty? We were able to host some of them. We've sent two more trips to Delhi University after I went, and um, more recently, until the pandemic hit, we were trying to uh, do a collaboration with a community radio station called Radio Active in Bangalore, which and study um, the ways in which they serve their community, and also work specifically with an RJ there who has um, written these transgender, who is transgender, and has written these transgender diaries. So to be able to talk and learn from them and bring it back and think about how we can work with our community radio stations over here. So I, um, that's, that's kind of where I'm going to end. And um, I'm really, again, very, very thankful for being able to be here and to sort of help be part of, be part of such a significant conference and to really talk about, you know, transnational solidarity, um, in a, you know, how we can be allies to each other in a time of crisis, um, in a time of a global pandemic, in a time of Black Lives Matter, Dalit Lives Matter, um, Women's Rights Matter. Um, and how can we really listen, um, work with each other to expose structures of power and privilege and also um, create resistance, passive or active. So with that, I'm just going to say thank you very much. And if there are questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thanks, Elorti. Thanks for your wonderful deliberation. And um, let me also tell you that I want to know about um, your take that uh, while the US President Donald Trump's administration is not done adding uncertainty to the lives of the foreigners uh, on legally valid visa, uh, visas in America also and, 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 the, and two weeks ago the US um, threw the plans of skilled professionals out of work by um, suspending foreign work visas basically that HB1 and um, that international students on F1 and M1 visas whose classes in the upcoming semester are fully online will not be allowed to stay in the country so what will be um, what what will be the condition of those indian um, women or, or the uh, indian female students those who are working there and at the same time studying there so what will be your take on it so i um i uh, you know i mean I, it, it's very hard to know i know that a lot of um, they were able, like, um, with the F1 visa, where the initial thing was that, I think a few weeks ago, they said all international students on an F1 visa would have to leave the country, you know, because, and, and where, I mean, my university is currently supposed to be going back to face-to-face -face teaching in a month, and I, I, we're very scared, you know, I mean, of doing that. But I know a lot of universities really pushed back, Harvard, my MIT really pushed back against that because they, they wanted to international students and they wanted them for a diverse number of reasons 
So um, they have been, I think universities have been trying to offer online classes that will make it possible for students on F1 visas to, to be able to take um, that, uh, those classes. But it's, uh, and I know the international study centers at my university and other universities are trying to work very hard towards being as supportive as we can. Um, you know, we're in an election year in the US, so I think it's so hard to tell, I mean, what's going to happen. And um, it's, it's, they, I am seeing, you know, and I came here in the late 80s as a student, and I am seeing a burgeoning of white nationalism that I haven't seen before um, under this gov government. So I, there's also tremendous pushback. I am hopeful. I'm seeing amazing, you know, with the Black Lives Matter and the ways in which people, young people, white people, you know, across across race, across are coming forward to fight. So it's it, it's hard to predict, you know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to predict. So Lopa actually wrote a really interesting, good editorial op-ed piece, Lopa Basu, in for our local paper. And I think it's on her, on her Facebook profile, which might be, you know, useful. Yes, yes. Um, um, Smita ma'am wants to know the publication details of DRS Kuma. The, there, there are no publications. I haven't, I haven't uh, published it. It's, uh, it's in the. I mean, I'm trying to send it out now at this point in time, but I haven't it's actually extremely published. Extremely emotional, extremely emotional, and heart rendering. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's, uh, it's very. Okay. It's thank you, thank you for listening to it. Okay. Now, play, uh, let me take one or two questions. Mm. That is there. So there is a question that uh, how does one negotiate the gender oppression um, inherent in the structure and institution of family, especially given that there is no social support system available in a country like India? So how does one structure? Sorry, just can you repeat that a little? How does one negotiate the gender oppression inherent mm -hmm. in the structure and institution of family? Especially yeah. given that there is no social support system available in a country like India. Yeah, whereas in the US we do have, you know, that we have shelters, you know, we do have some government support. We do have, it's still, you know, in, in, in the US, I mean, I don't want to say that it's great because there's a lot of stigma attached, there is funding. Uh, but it's always being cut, that's terrible. And a lot of here, here a lot of our um, domestic violence victims are actually, uh, you know, killed by their abusers who track them down. I, you know, this with India, it is so, so hard. And I, I'm probably not the best person to speak to this. Um, but I think without communities of support, you know, how, where perhaps um, I should say, in terms of my own life, I'm also a widow. I love. My husband was American, but um, that, that, that part was fabricated, but he, you know, but uh, he, he's also passed away. So when I go back, I do, um, I think you, you know, if you don't have family members, male family members who can also step up, and this is perhaps an issue where we really need to, I remember thinking of that ad that I saw once in India where it said, hit your wife and your son will go to jail. You know, I mean, if we don't educate men about how to be supportive allies, um, because they can use their privilege towards helping that. But I find India is very, very patriarchal. I wish there would be more government support, you know, and, and maybe people in the audience could tell me more about that. But I think also trying to educate people against the stigma of caste and class and, and, and violence. It's a very, I don't know that I have, I'm sorry, I'm not really being able to answer the question, but I think it's a very serious problem. And I'd be really excited to know how other people think about it. Okay, okay, okay. there is another question that is, uh, when will be the dream come true in the life of Indian women's life that's in women's reservation bill and why women don't um, fight seriously for their rights in USA also, for instance, seats for vast jobs and domestic crisis. Please give your comment on it that uh, women, they are doing um, the activities in USA also. Uh, when will it come to know this kind of scenario? When Mm. their lives also matter to, to a great extent and they will also come and they will fight for their rights. 
I, I think it's an in, it's it, this has becomes an issue of intersectionality, right? Because women will also yes. support patriarchal privilege if it benefits them, right? So we will have white women who will not who will stand with white men rather than you know or upper caste women in the women who will stand with upper caste men, you know, in uh, rather than uh, connect across class or caste with women, and because there are benefits to doing that, you know, and I think. Um, how to create a sort of solidarity across class caste based on gender and sexuality. Um, I, you know, Gayatri Spivak a long time ago talked about strategic essentialism, you know, when uh, you, in, when, yeah, for this particular historical moment of resistance to happen, you need to focus on this particular issue, you know, maybe it's domestic violence. And this is what you, and across class, across caste, across, you, you look at, or in the US maybe, Racism, and you know, like I guess an example with Black Lives Matter is very quickly we've we've all because we've all had to deal with racism in the U.S. All of us, whether we're brown or yellow or whatever, but it's nothing. The racism you, we can't use this moment of Black Lives Matter to talk about ourselves. It has to be about you know African Americans. It has to be particularly about African American men who are incarcerated and at, at greater rates than anybody else who suffer all of this. So I think we have to be very careful and very strategic about how we talk about a specific issue and focus all our energies onto that issue rather than muddying the waters and trying to everyone jump on one that way. Okay, okay, okay. I'm also telling that there is Professor K. Gita is there, Professor Bonijad is there and Professor Smita Agarwal is there. If you want to ask any question or if you want to take part in this talk, you can also unmute yourself and you can ask questions also in case if you want to do so. That would be great because I think all of you would be more qualified. So. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm just um, going to thank you for taking time from your busy schedule today and want to let you know that we are uh, very excited about this opportunity to dive into this kind of academic atmosphere created by you and others also and we think that it has exceeded the expectation of the listeners of the very first day of this faculty development program. I am again repeating this is not the webinar, this is a faculty development program and the day one is Mm, coming to the end and the talk of Professor Asashen was particularly appreciated at this time when we are considering new kind of initiatives or approaches mm, to see the condition of women, gender and sexuality in the other context also. And many of us are specially interested in analysis of the resources available and uh, they all want to mm, want you to get published that piece so that we all um, get the chance to read that and and editing will sustain uh, will definitely going to sustain our collective growth also on that aspect and we believe that you can make yourself available for any further academic discussions or interactions on part of our institution again thank you all for your time and consideration Th thank you uh, professor Asasin, thank you, Dr. K. A. Gita, thank you, Professor Smita Garwal, thank you, Professor Bonijade also, and thank you, Aparajita Hajra, Professor Aparajita Hajra, and thank you, Professor Rano Unial, for making the first day a truly memorable one. I'm extremely indebted to all of you. Okay. So, uh, th this is the end of the first day and I am um, waiting for you all for the second day and the session will start from 6 p.m. That is tomorrow from 6 p.m. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. I'm going to end the broadcast. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm just writing a comment. I look forward to <laughs> yes, yes. I really do look forward to tomorrow and to being able to see it all on YouTube too. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh. Thanks. 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 Yeah. Okay. Thanks.